So let's look at, first and foremost, the title again. We're looking at the angel from heaven in 10, 1 to 4. Uh, it's it's an interlude, an intermission of sorts uh, between the events of the plagues and the continuation of these uh, warnings and calling to the humanity to repent lest destruction come upon them. And the we see in this description of the angel, his face is the sun, his legs is pillars of fire, and other aspects we're going to be analyzing tonight. Of course, uh, basically repent, repeating and presenting the teaching of, of Elder Athanasio. Let's read the text, as usual, in Greek and then English, and in the Orthodox New Testament version uh, besides the King James. So we begin with the Greek. Keidon alon angelon iskiron katavenon da ectu uranu perivevlimenon nefelin ki iris epitis kefelis aftu keto prosopon aftu os o ilios ke ipodes aftu os stili peros ke ekon entin hiri aftu vivlion aneogmenon ke etheke ton podo aftu to dexion epitis thalasis ton de evonimon Epitis gis, ke ekraxe foni magalios per leon micate, ke ote ekraxe ne lalis en iepta vronde tis tase afton fonas, ke ote elalis en iepta vronde emelon grafin grafin, ki kusa fonine tuura nu legusan, sfragison a elalison iepta vronde. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. In the Orthodox New Testament, slight difference is not major. And I saw another strong angel coming down out of the heaven, having been clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a book having been opened. And he set his foot, the right one, on the sea, and the left one on the land, and he cried out with a voice, a loud voice, even as the lion roareth. And when he cried, the seven thunders spoke their own sounds. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was up about to write, and I heard a voice out of the heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven thunders spoke, and do not begin to write them. Okay, so not major differences here, nothing really all that important. But it's interesting that we do have in this fourth line from the top, uh, we do have, let's see if we can, we have his feet as pillars of fire. Uh, but it's, it could possibly be his legs they could be in legs, feet and legs are a little obscure in the Greek if it's only the bottom part or the entire, uh, what we call leg in English. So it does in the iconography really speak to the whole leg and not just the bottom of the uh, leg, which is properly speaking the feet in English. So minor difference. but uh, And then just some differences in terms of um, this this. Translation is always very, quite literal and trying to maintain the um, pr the present continuous voice, uh, but nothing uh, of major note that I can see. All right, let's go to the uh, the commentary on this book by uh, Elder Athanasios. First of all, we need to realize that if you remember from last time, uh, we're talking about this plague, which. Uh, it says there in the last line that the second woe is past, but really it is it is synonymous, simultaneous rather, si simultaneous with this description in 10, 1 to 4. In fact, the whole chapter of 10, it really goes through all the way to 11, 13. The plague continues. So 
they're, they're, they're not, we're not quite out of that, uh, even though it's not being focused on. And there's two interludes uh, between the six and seven trumpet calls. We're in the, after the sixth, going to the seventh. And just as there were between the six and seven seals previously. And the interlude and the sixth trumpet scene, as I said, are really simultaneous. So that's very quick, but uh, important note. Now, these intermissions or these interludes uh, prepare us for the seventh plague. And they're, they're not uh, unimportant. And there, there's a lot of significance. And Elder Athanasius is pointing out a lot of important and significant matters here. Uh, for the sake of the faithful, every detail, every single detail has great meaning and is pointing to the faithful, giving them uh, both consolation and 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 uh, orientation and at times understanding. So the intermissions allow us to, to the reader as well to catch the, our breath, prepare for us the, for an extensive uh, description uh, of the and, and the extensive plague of the seventh trump, trumpet call, which contains a focal point that can be seen as the nucleus of the entire book. That's very interesting, very important. It's really during the seventh plague that's coming up that the presence of the Antichrist is clearly seen. So now we're arriving at the presence of the Antichrist. And it's very interesting. All the plagues come before and basically are preparing the way, allowing, because there is no repentance allowing for uh, the demons and the and the devil to have more rights on humanity and more illusion uh, for his ascent. So very interesting and very much con consistent with everything we know about our own spiritual life I, on a macro level, uh, our own spiritual life. What when we see uh, power and 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 authority given to the demons in our life, we know that there's been a previous fall apostasy a laxity, whatever, d depending on the degree and the, depending on what we're talking about. But these things go together. There has to be a yes from man, whether to God or to the demons. And so it's not it's not at all uh, insignificant. The call for repentance is saying here we have time to reverse all of these things and avoid the destruction, which is what the devil, of course, wants for humanity. It's He's bringing upon because we're giving him that door, we're opening that door for him uh, and, and the deception that he brings. So, uh, and so this is, again, during the seventh plague that the presence of the Antichrist is clearly seen, which is why the seventh plague is so extensive, so difficult and terrible in its description. Now, uh, the two interludes that we're going to see are basically one has to do with St. John, another with the faithful and for the sake of the faithful. Uh, so here we see St. John as if uh, sitting on earth and, and but silently watching as if in heaven. I mean, the entire vision is, is, is of heaven in heaven. The entirety of chapter 10 that we're going to look at is in this first interlude. And, and the second one that's coming up is it refers to the two prophets who, who will point out the Antichrist. All right. So the, the second one is, is, is referring to the two prophets. That will point out the Antichrist. And of course, we know who they are, don't we? Yes. Uh, Enoch and Elias. We'll talk about that in future lectures. Uh, and so this uh, second one it really continues the first. And it's a considered a key hermeneutical page in the entire book of Revelation. Very, very, very important. Hermeneutical meaning of great uh, importance in terms of interpreting and understanding the text. So let's look at 10.1 again. And I saw another strong angel. This is the Orthodox New Testament version. Strong angel coming down out of the heaven, having been clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow was on his head. And his face was as the sun. And his feet as pillars of fire or his legs. Another version, a translation that I've seen. So this is the end of the plagues. We're going toward the end of the plagues. And we're beginning the end of the end times. This is what is being described here. So it is, there is some chronological. It's not just cyclical, but it's chronological. We have, we're approaching the end of the end. So uh, this angel is not like previous angels mentioned. He's from heaven. He's clothed in bright cloud, rainbow, face, legs, all of this we just described. 
and he has great power and strength. He's a mighty angel. Uh, and it is this splendid cosmic and su stupendous super appearance here that is worthy of Jesus Christ, whom he represents and whom and for whom he is being sent to express his message to St. John. So this is clearly an angel from the Lord sent to St. John and representing him uh, and has all the splendor and glory that would be uh, one would expect. Now, this interesting in, in Hebrew, the term that's used here, this mighty angel, uh, uh, Gibor is the is the Hebrew term, and it can be translated as a mighty angel. And Elder Athanasius asks, well, maybe this is, in fact, the um, Archangel Gabriel. Could it be the Archangel Gabriel? Uh, and we don't, he doesn't answer that question. We're not sure, but it's very interesting. The mighty angel, one, of course, well, together with Michael, are the mightiest of angels today, and well, as, as far as 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 salvation history goes, today more than ever we need to have the knowledge of this mighty angel, since evil appears so terribly enticing that Elder Athanasius says, "I do not know who can manage to always stand upright." So here is a special providential economy of God. He sends this angel in this time of the ends of these plagues and the on the eve of the end of the end times precisely to support the faithful because it's so terrible the times the presence of this mighty angel brings great consolation to the faithful because it counters uh the mightiest evil currently uh enveloping this planet you know, it's not just the Orthodox Christians or just Christians in general, but many, many people of goodwill are crying out across the world right now and saying, what is happening in this world? Things are descent, dissolving and there's, there's a descent into evil. I was talking uh, recently, I had an interview uh, with a newly illumined Orthodox Christian over at uh, Counter Punch. I, I think that's if I got the, the title right. And it's going live right now as we speak. Uh, this interview that we did a few days ago. And it was interesting because he was totally not even a Christian, really not practicing, not interested at all. But he, during this COVID insanity, he said something's going on here that is not just a political question. This is a question of spiritual uh, spiritual nature. And by God's providence, he very quickly was introduced to orthodoxy and almost uh, just down you know, in his town, he had a church, he went and that was it. He became Orthodox very quickly. I was really impressed with, uh, obviously, he had been searching for truth for quite some time for that kind of quick development. My point here is that he understood far away from the teachings of the Orthodox Church that what he was witnessing was a terrible spiritual delusion and temptation for humanity, and there was deception on a grand scale. There were Orthodox Christians who didn't get that, and that is always a mystery. Right, a mystery of of this of one's disposition, one's uh, openness, humility. How God's light enters into the intellects of those who are yet to be regenerated, and yet those some who are are, are regenerated, or at least they say they're regenerated. Um, that that light is not reaching them, and they're not discerning the signs. They're not discerning. The nature of the of the of the temptation. So, I, I just as a little aside, um, it is uh, it is you know with the with the opportunity here of what Elder Athanasius was saying, uh, it's very very interesting. I think there's going to be a lot of su such uh, surprises uh, uh, in the days ahead. Uh, and again, uh, there are many people who are saying, yes, we have a mighty current of evil that's enveloping our planet, as he says here 40 years ago. Such consolation is especially necessary as today's Christians are weaker in numbers and worthiness compared to all those who had lived previously. We are in need of this mighty angel. We might we must feel his presence just as we feel the need for a powerful and strong family leader. So uh, th this is a great consolation for the faithful. And you go, as you see going forward, 
a lot of the symbolism that's that's mentioned here by St. John is for that purpose, to console the faithful. So one of the things that it says here is it's coming down from heaven. And that's not also an accident at all. We have other examples in Scripture where the descent is extremely important to understand the the origin, and there's the opposite when we're talking about the Antichrist in the description in the book of Revelation. He's said to come up from where? The depths of the sea. And when we get there, we'll see that this, this the depths of the sea of this world, this spiritual uh, darkness, right? It's, it's, the deep sea is very, very dark, and and uh, it's the opposite, uh, the 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 absence of of the light of God, and that's the symbolism. So when we get there, we'll talk about. It, but that's that's the juxtaposition with with this angel coming down from heaven. We see in the Old Testament, for instance, in Samuel, when King Saul went to receive counsel about the outcome of the war with the Philistines. He had participated in a seance. This is the great betrayal of the king, a seance conducted by a female medium who called upon the spirits. Among these spirits were supposedly that of prophet Samuel himself. About the uh, Obviously, this was an evil spirit pretending to be the spirit of Samuel to deceive, who was asked about the outcome of the war to take place the following day. The medium says, I see a God coming up out of the earth. 1 Samuel 28, 7 to 14. This is an evil spirit, the elder says, of the same type of evil spirits we encounter when we visit psychics or mediums or hold seances. Unbelievably, I've noticed over my 30 years as an Orthodox Christian, but 20, almost 20 years as a priest, well, 20 years this, 20 years this year, and that is that. I don't know, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming this is happening in other parts of the Orthodox world, but in Greece. And especially among Greeks abroad, I've I've had well, I've had the, them write to me. There's not a small number who amazingly are so deluded that they seek the counsel of mediums and psychics and say and hold seances, and they think desperate because of their in, insecurity. This is always the case of so many of the sins that people commit is their lack of faith, lack of trust, lack of security. Right? They they have deep insecurity for a variety of reasons. And they run thinking they'll find security through the demons. And even though they've been raised as Orthodox Christians, not a number, not a large number, but it's interesting that there's such people that have the grace of the church, and yet still they turn to the demons. And there are many people. If you walk through New York City today, as I did many times uh, years ago when I was coming and going, uh, they're all over the place in certain parts of the city. So it is, uh, it is. Um, here, of course, an evil spirit that he's speaking about and, and he's getting information from. It's not the spirits of the dead, as some deluded people think, that they can communicate with the dead, uh, which they're invoking and trying to communicate with their dead father or mother or something. This is delusional, and it's awful that they're giving rights to the enemy and they're falling after the evil spirits. These are evil spirits, demons, who pretend to be the souls of the deceased. It's pitiful that there's such ignorance among orthodox christians these spirits do not come from heaven they wander about within natural creation they're not coming as this angel from heaven does the verse from samuel a god coming up out of the earth reveals precisely their demonic quality and so that is a very important thing because it, as you'll see going forward we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight that all the false prophets and all of the all of the demonically inspired fake messiahs are going to come from the earth up from the earth not from the heavens the lord comes from the heaven the false prophets from the earth this is a basic criteria of authenticity a basic criteria of authenticity as the lord says for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Now, mind you, we're not talking about the sky. We're talking about heaven. We're not talking about the, the lower parts of this world. That's still of this world, right? There will be signs like the UFO insanity and, and craze that is, is even happening now among some very, very gullible people who think there's such a thing as a UFO coming in there. We all know from our patristic literature and our 
uh, saints today. These are the demons. I think we might have to do a podcast on that because, unfortunately, there are not a small number of people who are deluded and thinking that there are actually UFOs coming and that we're going to have to fight some kind of battle or I don't know what with UFOs in the near future. So the uh, there will be in this world and among the uh, lower parts of the sky demonic appearances and demonic things happening in the days of Antichrist. So we're not talking about coming from the sky. We're talking about coming from heaven, from the heavenly realm. Okay, it's different. But again, the basic criteria of authenticity, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Let's not be deceived. Many false prophets will come, but not from heaven, right? The first coming of Christ took place at his humble birth from the Most Holy Theotokos in Bethlehem. That's not what we're expecting any longer. No earthly king or Messiah. That will be the Messiah of the uh, of the deluded Jews who do not embrace Christ, and they will unfortunately follow after an earthly Messiah who will give them power and fame and fortune and and, and control that they seek, many of them seek, who are, who are alien to Christ. But there will be a lot of faithful, sincere, moral uh, Jews who will embrace Christ, as prophesied uh, in Scripture. The Apostle Paul speaks of this, the return of Israel, the faithful remnant who will listen to the prophets, uh, Elias and Enoch preaching, and will come back and embrace Christ. Uh, so it will not be, again, at the, as he came first. His second coming will not be the same. It will He will come down from heaven, and he will be seen. He will be seen across the universe. He says, in, Saint Paul says in Philippians three twenty, our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And elsewhere in Acts, we we hear, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This is at the ascension, right? The angel turns to the apostles, and he says, why do you stand looking? Into heaven, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So these are scriptural passages which witness to the nature of the second coming. Also, this angel coming down from heaven that we're looking at right now in 10, 1 to 4. So the descent of Christ will be from heaven and it will be visible to everyone. Contrary to the delusion of the Chilias, the Jehovah's Witnesses and other Chilias or Chilias, those who believe in the millennium, the reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years, who said again and again, these poor, pathetic, deluded, heretical minded Jehovah's Witnesses who have said again in the 20s, numeral times, all the way up in the 1800s, that we're waiting now, any time now, Christ is coming next year. The, and they, the year passes and they're coming again. It reminds you of this Greta Thunberg who said in 2023, we're going to have the end of the world with the carbon apocalypse and she had to rescind that i saw today these are the kind of charlatans whether they be in the secular world or whether they be among the so-called religious uh that we have to avoid but at all costs if we want to remain faithful and not be deluded in the end uh, times that we are approaching so the lord will come from heaven how will he be seen by all as it says in scripture he'll be seen by all he will be visible to all creation mystically. Listen to what the elder says. If Christ comes to the one hemisphere, people will ask, the, 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 the naive and gullible say, well, if he comes to one hemisphere, like he comes to Jerusalem or whatever, how will people in the other hemisphere see him? Well, Christ, he says, will be visible to all creation, not only the earth. So it's certainly not a geographical problem. It's not a limitation geographically here this is the god uh, and the creator of heaven and earth so this is a you know pretty we're pretty limited here in our very limited rational outlook this is so common among the naysayers and the atheists and the agnostics and the various heretical groups they're always coming with their there are poor rational intellect formed mostly by uh just analysis cold uh, limited analysis on a very low level of the nature of things. And now we're trying to make sense of the mysteries of God. I mean, it's it's tragic and pathetic. And yet this is what happens. 
when people are not initiated into the mysteries of the uh, of the church and the mystery of the incarnation and there's not a purification process even among orthodox christians if there is not a purification process they can end up saying ridiculous things there's no guarantee because you physically are in the church or you say the creed every sunday no matter how sincere you are, if you don't go through a process of purification, and we're all on that process all of our life, but we need to make progress before we make statements and open our mouth and speak as if we have authority. That's why we sit at the feet of the fathers, as we sit at the feet of the saints, and we say what they say. We have self knowledge. We say, "What am I? Who am I? Right? What am I? What, what business do I have speaking as an authority on anything?" And unfortunately, there's so many, quote unquote, authorities today. This is the nature of the times we live in. There's so many people who just pop off. And, and God forbid we ever end up popping off here in this place. This is a place where we follow the Holy Fathers and we, we present what they teach. Otherwise, please uh, delete Orthodox Ethos from your uh, subscribe subscription uh, list there. I don't, I don't, uh, God forbid, because that would be worse, right, if we ended up acting like the world and getting arrogant and saying we know anything i mean what we the little that we add we hope is simply a further clarification of what has already been stated uh and and presented by the saints so christ will be visible to all creation not only to the earth but he will also be visible in a mystical manner from every point of the universe and from anywhere one may be within his reign his kingdom and is there any place that that he is not? No, he's in all all creation. Every he's everywhere present and fills all things. So, although the infinite God was united with human nature, not even the small stature of man could somehow make him small, or create some kind of distance between us and him. So, you know, throw away these limited uh, ideas if you have them by chance, and understand the greatness of God is far beyond what we can conceive. Now, we see in this picture, there is a rainbow over his head of this angel. And this is a symbol of peace and reconciliation. It's a consolation for the faithful. A third feature of this mighty seventh angel is that he has a rainbow on or over his head. And what is a rainbow? Well, a rainbow comes after a rainstorm because without rain, there can be no rainbow, right? So it appears while it rains and the sun comes out. So this is a physical uh, phenomenon. It's always been there in creation. And it's a symbol, however, it's given this meaning by the Lord himself uh, after the flood of Noah, right? The rainbow is the symbol of peace and reconciliation for that per for that for that reason. This is true, not of LGBTQYZ, whatever. It's, it has nothing to do with that. Zero, nothing to do with that whatsoever. Unfortunately, they've adopted it only to pervert it and destroy it. But for us as Christians, we know what it means, and it means peace and reconciliation. This is true only for the people of faith, right? Not for the non-believers. They don't understand the symbol as is testimony by this uh, co-opting of it by those who have rejected the teaching of the gospel. The rainbow appeared after the flood during the time of Noah. Of course, given our common knowledge of rainbows, it did not appear for the first time then. Some people think it it, it, it appeared then. It was never there was never a, a rainbow on uh, Earth before that. No, it pre-existed. But now it's been given this new meaning. This is what the Lord does again and again. He takes existing things. He says, now from this point forward, this is what this will mean. This is to remind you of the peace and reconciliation that came and the restoration that came after the flood. Uh, and he promised, it also reminds us of this promise. He promised that he would not destroy the world with a flood ever again. And of course, God is true, right? God will never again destroy the earth with a flood. So let's talk just a minute about this use of symbols, which is very important for us if we're going to interpret not only the book of Revelation, but the life in Christ and all of Scripture. A non-believer could ask, well, I don't understand this. Why is this natural phenomenon now a symbol of all these things you're talking about, right? Why does that happen? Well, again, it exists and it always existed. But God uses this, this natural phenomenon as a sign or as a mark. He uses that, and it's very important 
this is how he uses symbols. We did talk about this, but I'm going to repeat it here because I want to make sure I get it exactly right as the elder presents it. Uh, and we use natural phenomenon, for example, when we walk in an unfamiliar place and use a tree or a huge stone for a guide or landmark in order to find our way back, right? So we have all, all time, all many, many times in our life, we've used these physical things for a greater, deeper meaning and as a mark. So God does the same thing with the rainbow. And to all of us, the descendants of Noah, this means uh, that remember my promise, a flood such as this will never be repeated. And God is true again. Uh, but the, this is this is not to say, however, that there will never be a catastrophe. There will never be another destruction of this world because we know in the Apostle Peter's epistles and in other places that the end of the world will come through a great catastrophe, a great destruction of the natural world. So let's, let's not confuse that that particular way and for that purpose, it'll never come again. But there will be a second destruction with fire. The Apostle Peter affirms this very clearly. He says, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. 2 Peter 3.10. What is the nature of this fire? What is this? This is very interesting. Who? At the time of Peter, Peter's writing of this, what could they have thought? I mean, fire was pretty limited at that time, right? Fire would have been started by sticks and maybe stones and, you know, to heat someone. Or I mean, there's not a, There wasn't a huge, expansive, global way that the whole world could, could be ignited uh, and dissolved by fire. So... It's pretty amazing what he's saying and how he could have understood it. Today, however, it's not hard to understand, is it? Where does your mind go? Right there to the nuclear possibilities, right? The nuclear power. He says in 3, 11, and 12, listen to this. Since all things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hesitating the, and, and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. He says it again. So what is this dissolution and this melting? Well, the elder says within creation, within nature, there is fire. And this fire will be freed from within nature. Of course, this would be unimaginable at the time of the writing of the Apostle Peter, another testimony to the truth of the gospel, truth of the, of the revelation. Uh, really quite, quite amazing. And we are in the days when this is possible. We are living in days when it's possible for, in one way or another, this fire, this power, this energy that's in nature itself to, to be let loose. Now, how and how will that happen? No one no one knows. That doesn't mean it's going to be a nuclear war. I don't think that's what the elder is implying. But simply that this is possible within nature to understand that this is something uh, that you could talk about today. And there, there's a physical, scientific way to explain how that could possibly happen. Chain reaction of energy that's stored within nature itself by God. So, But the purpose of this angel is not yet to tell us about the end of this world and the destruction by fire, but rather to console us, to console us. And this is the difference between the Christians and the non-believers, that the end of the world is not terrifying for the Christian, because right behind the end of this physical fallen world is what? The reign of God, the consummation of everything, the heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. It's a consolation for us that the time is near. It's a consolation for the Christians, not for the unbelievers. So the elder says, the history is coming to an end. The energy stored within matter will be released. The changing of the universe will take place. All things are thus to be dissolved, the apostle Peter said. After this, all that remains is the kingdom of God. History 
will have come to an end. It's amazing. It's, f- it's just phenomenal. The, uh, the, 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 the mystery of the gospel and the knowledge that, that is given to the believer through the scriptures and through the fathers and through the saints is just mind blowing. He goes on, he says, this provides the faithful with much consolation so that they can be encouraged and not be weary. The word of God tells us not to lose heart. We will see this as a as we continue. The purpose of this presence of this angel is precisely to console the faithful, to help them realize the time will be no more and the end is near. And that is a consolation. So he's not just got a rainbow above his head, but he's clothed in a cloud. And this cloud, as we see in other parts of Scripture, always interpreting Scripture with Scripture, and, of course, through it in the Holy Fathers and Holy Tradition, is divine protection. We see in Exodus 13, 21 to 14, 19 to 24, that there was a cloud in the desert, and that cloud was shade by day and night and light by night. And it led the people of Israel, the people of God, on their journey. And this cloud, as we know from patristic interpretation and the hymnography of the church, is the Son of God. The invisible logos, the pre-incarnate logos, this he himself is the cloud. He was the one giving shade, giving light, and guiding the people. They saw a cloud, but it was Christ. Christ is the one who led them into the promised land. And we have this in the hymnography of Holy Week. Very interesting. Now, this is just a paraphrase. Uh, so it's not the actual hymn, but it's a paraphrase of the hymn. My people, what have I done to you that you deny me? He's talking now to the Jews, the people who led, who led, he led through the wilderness. Did I not feed you in the desert with manna? I filled your thirst with water from the rock. I was in the form of the cloud, which gave you shadow and light and guided you. There it is, right there, exactly. The church is saying through its hymnography. By the way, hymnography is one of the best places to acquire the dogmatic mindset outlet, outset, uh, sorry, outlook of the church in the hymnography. Unfortunately, for many of you in the English-speaking world, you don't understand or you don't have access or you don't take pains to have access to the hymnography. And, and many of us, and myself, are not diligent in pouring over the hymnography of the church. But if we were, we would have such a rich source of the formation of the mind of Christ within us. And here's an example of that, right? This is from the patristic writings, of course. They're writing hymnography on the basis of the great teachers of the church, like St. Basil the Great and St. Gregory the Theologian, John Chrysostom and Gregory of Nyssa and all, all the great saints. And some of them are great dogmatic teachers themselves, like St. John of Damascus, who's writing a lot of the hymnography uh, as well. So this is from the core of the mind of Christ in the church, telling us how to understand scripture. This is the son of God. And he says, my people, what have I done to you that you now deny me? Uh, I, I was the cloud. I, I guided you. I fed you uh, in the wilderness and all the rest. So this is a cloud of divine protection. This is a cloud of divine protection. The cloud is a symbol of divine presence. The divine protection is the presence of God himself, his providence, his care, right? God is closer to you and I than to, we are to ourselves. Uh, someone wrote me and felt despair. I forget what it was. Now there's so many little messages coming these days through the social media or through the comments and YouTube. And they were in despair. They were this, that. I said, God is closer to you than you know. He's never abandoned you. He never will abandon you. The problem is we have given rights to the enemy. We have formed bad habits. And now we have to go through a long, sometimes a long process of patient purification. And that's showing that if we do that, we show the love we have for Christ and our determination to be with him. And that's good for us because that overcomes the bad habits and the old man in us. And so far from seeing all these temptation struggles and problems as a a reason for despair, we should see it as a, a reason for hope, a reason that God is working with us, right? Far, far from it. So never despair. God is there and the cloud here is a sign of his divine protection for the Christians of the last times. The Lord said that when the angel appears with his cloud, it shows the divine presence is not absent. When the Lord said these melancholy words, the days are coming 
when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it, he says in Luke 17, 22. He had in mind primarily the days, the very, very last days, right, that we're, that we're talking about here. When there will be much tribulation and the faithful will cry out for the Lord to show them a sign of his presence. And there will be isolation. There will be isolation, not unlike that felt by the prophet Elias when he said, I'm alone. And then the Lord said, no, 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 you're not alone. There's 6,000 sons of the prophets that have not bowed their knees to the demons, to Baal. And so even the prophet thought he was alone. And there will be many, many Christians, who, and there probably are now, and maybe even some of you listening to me right now, feel that you are isolated, that you don't have someone, but do not feel that. Rather, the fact that you're here, even via the internet, shows that God's providence has worked mightily in your life to bring you to the church or bring you to the catechumenate or bring you to the feet of the, of entering the church. Uh, it is God's care for each and every one of us that we have what we have. The little or much that we have been given uh, is all of God. And that's his providence. That's his protection. That's the cloud here that we see that's overshadowing the people of God. It did in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the people of old, and now uh, the people in the end time. So there will be harsh and difficult days. And here now, this little pause in, in the plagues we have from this angel, this intermission, is a great sign of consolation and will be in those days as well. There will be great encouragement coming from heaven for the believers. Now, this card in particular you've seen i've kind of i've done a little bit more to this card because i want you to pay really close attention very important here very wonderful uh, theological spiritual uh direction from the great elder and so i made it different so that it would stand out and you would pay attention especially to the highlighted sections let's just go read it and i'll comment as we go and i want you to pay close attention let us not forget that the gathering of the faithful is a manifestation of the church why is he talking about this? he's talking about the end times, and the people coming together, and he's liking it to the, the those in the early church, that even in the midst, as you'll see, even in the midst of great persecution, they, they did not fail to become and be the church. Very, very important. We're going to talk about why that's so important. We've already lived through some of the things that has taught us, I hope, why that's so important. Let us not forget, and this is, the, this is what's happening in the end times. There'll be great persecution, great a harsh reality. People will say, where is God? That's one of the great scandals of the last days, right? We have, there's many scandals that take people away from the church. We, we hear about them from different people. Oh, so-and-so is scandalized by the behavior of that priest or that bishop or that Christian, and he's left the church. Well, guess what? There are many such scandals awaiting us. Scandals, right? Where is God? People say, where is God? Why is he stopping all this evil in the world? They have fundamentally are putting the sins of mankind and our own sins, we are co-responsible for this, re this reality. Let's not forget. We are all co-responsible. We are the problem. Christians are the problem that we are in such a state of the world today. Let's never forget that. Never point fingers at all the people who've never heard the gospel or never part of the church. It's our fault, ultimately. Our, meaning collectively, we Christians and we Orthodox in particular, the, the responsibility is great among those who are in the one body, the one church. So, so there will be a great scandal in those days. Where is God, right? So he's, let's not forget that in the early church and in all the days of persecution and during the Soviet period in the 20s and 30s, they never failed to what? To come together as the church. You can read about it in our series on the new martyrs of Russia, how they would build underground churches under under houses, they would they, they there was no way that they were not going to come together, even if it's two or three or five or ten for the divine liturgy. It was impossible, and it is impossible for the church to cease to do that. And he asked, doesn't it impress you that the faithful met in catacombs? Underground catacombs were in Rome, underground tombs, right? So this is not like Probably there are probably snakes or something down there, probably mice down there. It's not like people, oh, the catacombs, so was well, so romantic. No, 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 it was difficult, it was terrifying, it was not an easy thing to do. You were caught, you were killed. You're praying over the tombs, you know. We are so so 
spoiled today. We talk about that as if we would do it. I don't know if we would do it. Would we go and risk our life to worship over the tombs of the martyrs? I don't know. Doesn't it make an impression on you that the faithful met in catacombs and secret places using secret methods so as not to be detected by their oppressors? Yet they insisted on meeting every night. We think, well, they met just for Sunday. No, no, they were getting together all the time. All the time. Liturgy was not just for Sunday. If you're just a Sunday-going liturgy fo folk, it's a problem. I know some of you are far away from divine liturgy, and you can only get there. That's a different issue. Maybe you're an hour, two, three, five. Some people are six, seven hours away. Whatever it is. Like somebody's wrote me from New Zealand, said, I'm seven hours from a, an Orthodox church. Okay, I said, look, whatever it is, it is. God sees it all. Start. Do what you can. Take the steps. God is is in charge. It's not impossible for him. If we love and struggle, he will meet us undoubtedly uh, and give us his grace. There's no limits for him to do that. The limits are what we erect. And so the challenge is there. Now, they didn't say, I'll meet once in a while. They didn't, they didn't say, well, let's just uh, do our prayers at home, right? They endangered their very existence and risked confiscation of their property and their loss of their own lives. Couldn't each person have stayed home and worship God by himself? Now, if they had been in the day of internet, this, or if the elder had been in the day of internet, I don't doubt that he would have said, couldn't they have live streamed? Couldn't they have uh, heard it through some kind of technological means? on the radio. Isn't that enough? Can they say their cross from their couch? No, it was not enough. It's impossible to imagine that they would have allowed that. They didn't. In fact, the faithful acted this way because it was in this manner that the presence of the church was established in history. That's why the church existed and existed today, because no matter what, they gathered as the church. They came together and offered the holy sacrifice, the divine liturgy. They came together as the Eucharistic synaxis around the body and blood of Christ and communed of the body and blood of Christ. That was not negotiable. And yet we saw, to our great shame, not only did Orthodox Christians, forget the rest, some, some among the heterodox were bolder or as bold as other Orthodox. It's all depending on each one's disposition, but they were Orthodox who, who, who not only did not do this, but they voluntarily shut down the churches. So it's just, it's just unbelievable. And the, and the problem is not that as much as the unrepentance, right? Adam and Eve, listen to the serpent. They could have repented. They could have repented when the Lord came into the garden. They did not. They said, her fault. And she said, his fault. We fell. We need to realize we fell. We were not as we should have been during this COVID insanity. There's no way the Orthodox Church could ever shut its doors. Whatever that means. Do it in the house. Do it whatever. doesn't matter. You cannot stop the Eucharistic synaxis and the divine liturgy. It's impossible to imagine. And yet it happened. So God, and you say, well, what? how is it going to be that there will be great apostasy in the end times? Right there. We shut our doors without any threat to us. Zero. I mean, it's all coming out now. Anybody who's got eyes to see can see that none of those lockdowns and shutdowns and closures did anything. It was all a sham. Didn't protect anybody. Didn't save anybody. The masks don't save anybody. And it was all a sham. And it's all been, it's all been, it's coming out that it's was concocted in a, a lab and it and the, the vaccines are not saving they're killing i mean it's all coming out it, when are we going to repent when are we going to repent brothers and sisters god help us we have to pray all of us collectively need to assume responsibility and understand that it's our collective fault that we didn't stand and we need to repent and if we don't repent as a body as all of us together not pointing fingers it's not my intention to point fingers. It's, it's, to, it's to convict and, and go deeper in repentance. And if we don't do that collectively, we will fall worse. It'll be worse the next time. 
I hope to God that we're all on the path of repentance. Only time will tell, but this is key. Listen to what he says, and it's irreconcilable with what we did in 2020-21 during this so-called pandemic. All right? It's irreconcilable what we're hearing from Elder Athanasios with what we're doing today. In fact, again, the faithful acted this way because it was in this manner that the presence of the church was established in history. They gathered because they needed to reinforce the presence of the church among them. Regardless if the pagans or non-believers were persecuting them. So they had active persecution. They didn't care. They could have said, you know what? Priests could have said, you know what, guys? You're in danger in your life. Why don't you just stay home tonight? Let's not do this. You know, I don't want to see you die. Did they do that? No, they, they didn't do that. We don't have that. And if they did, they didn't, that would not have been something they praised and, and celebrated. They would have been ashamed. So it didn't happen. We need to come to terms with what we did. They did not fear death. Let no one fear death. It's a title of a book that we published. So rather, it's from James John Chrysostom, rather they gathered as the faithful who have the presence of the church and consequently the body of Christ. That was their identity. It was impossible for them not to gather. They are the body of Christ. They will gather. It's impossible. The church was and is the proof of Pentecost. Right? This is a key phrase. I love this phrase. The church was and is the proof of Pentecost. To all of you who have not experienced the body of Christ, the saints, right? Par excellence, the saints are the representatives and the manifestation of the body of Christ. There were there are many who have fallen, whether it be during Sergianism and the Soviet period or during COVIDism or during it, whatever it might be. There you will always find people, virtue and passions, right? Everywhere. You'll find people who stand, you'll find people who fall. But the church, the body of Christ, is manifest in those who are purified and illumined and have received the divine grace and manifested in their life. They are actually cooperating synergistically with the grace of God in the church. That's where you see the manifestation of the body of Christ. And that is the proof of Pentecost. We don't need to go back to anything. Pentecost is alive and well right now in the Orthodox Church. There are people who turn away, from, even Orthodox, from that. That's They're free. They're free to do that. But it exists. Anyone who say, well, uh, you know, am I going to, what should I do? Should I go to the, you know, the zealots or should I go to the papists or something because of X, Y, Z problem in the church? I say to them, are there saints today? Have they been glorified? Have they been, has God manifested that they are glorified in heaven? That's all you need. Follow them. doesn't matter what everybody else does. The, the, the Lord said to Peter, follow me. Forget the others. Follow me. Right. There's no excuse. There's no reason to get up and leave or to not struggle if there's saints today in this world, and there are, the church, Pentecost, is present. It's real, and it's open to us. And he goes on, for us who are gathered here and for everyone gathered in the church, we gather not only for the sermon, we're not Protestants, but also for the worship, I mean, it's divine liturgy, because as the, as the, apostle, as the church witnesses in their, in their whole life and divine liturgy, because all the past events can repeat themselves. What is he talking about there? He's talking, I think, about this idea of the keros, right? The keros of the of the kingdom, which means that the events of salvation history, the Eucharist, the, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, all of it is eternal. It's ever present. It's timeless, and that means that we enter into those. They're repeated, as it were, for us, but not because they're actually repeated. They're outside of time. They're timeless. And they're always present. The divine liturgy is constantly offered. We enter into that reality in the divine liturgy. We don't establish it. It's not repeated. It's existing continually, and we enter into it. We ascend to that reality in the church, and we participate. So those past events are repeated. What he means here is that that ever-present reality, all of those divine events were not just in time. They were in time, but they were also eternal because it's God. Right, God was carrying all that, and all of that is ever present and applicable and accessible to every human being on the face of the earth for, for all time. So that's why God is not a respecter of persons, he doesn't choose the 12 disciples and say, I'm gonna save you. God forbid we ever have that idea that Calvinistic blasphemy. God offers the same salvation to all humanity on the face of the earth, it's open to us. 
Now, there might be physical problems, distances, all kinds of obstacles, but it's still open to us. The reality is there. It's mystically present for every human being on the face of the earth because it's eternally present. It's always open. It's always accessible in the church, through the church, to all of humanity. This is an amazing and very important message right there uh, from the elder for us right now in this world, in this post-COVID insanity that we're still living because there's not repentance, unfortunately. Now, let's look at Revelation. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's look at Pentecost in Larissa in 1991. I love this footnote in the book, and I want to talk about it. Now, this is a picture on the left up here of the translator of the books that we're, tra that we're reading. This is Constantine Zalalas, who was uh, our guest at our conference back in Antiochian Village in October. He's a good friend of ours. We still want to have him on uh, and to talk about the elder at some point. And he talks about the following. I thought it was important. Who is Elder Athanasios? This is one little snapshot into who he was and who he is. Uh, and you know, may God bless it that we that more and more material and about his life come out. I know Constantine is working on something along these lines uh, of the life of the elder for all of us in the English speaking world. And he says, "I had the blessing to witness Orthodox gatherings of Pentecostal dimensions." in the city of Lodisa in 1991, during which the elder ministered to around 3,000 people on any given Sunday. So he, every Sunday he was giving these lectures and other many, many other lectures, thousands of them, to the people of Lodisa, right in central Greece. And 3,000 people, were, it's, Greek numbers, that's mind-boggling. I mean, we're not in New York City, right? This is like Lodisa, not a huge metropolis. 3,000 people were coming on every Sunday outside, inside the church, around the church, to hear his lecture, to hear his homily. Roughly three, 300 began, uh, people began the day at the monastery with divine liturgy. By 5 p.m., 800 teenagers had gathered for their lesson, and from 79, there were over 2,000 adults present. All right, so he had 800 teenagers coming out for their, for their own lesson. And then from 7 to 9 at night, he had 2,000. These gatherings drew people not only from Lodessa, but from Athens and other cities in Greece as well. Unfortunately, a few years later, this is very common in the lives of the saints, by the way. Don't let it scandalize you. This is very common, unfortunately. A few years later, the secular spirit of some of the powerful bishops who were secularized, and they exist, and they have always existed, unfortunately, succeeded in breaking up those meetings. I don't know why and what pretense they didn't want to have people coming to hear the gospel. I can't imagine it, but I'd like to ask Constantine. Father Athanasius was secluded then in the monastery up in Stomio, which is about an hour outside of Lardisem, unwilling to compromise with their secular spirit. They, they were probably demanding something from him. I don't know what. Until he reposed in the Lord in 2006, only about three to 400 people were capable of attending his lessons at the monastery because the place didn't hold more and, and also because they had the uh, an hour uh, uh, drive from Larissa. at the same time over 300 bible study groups were and are still functioning in the area of Larissa, and most of them receiving guidance from Calder Athanasius so there you go another small witness I love those insights into who uh, is teaching us very important uh, that we sit at his feet and understand who we're dealing with this is the great elder Athanasios so the face of the angel was like the sun, it says. And what is this but the divine glory? This is a symbol of the divine glory of our Lord. The very same divine glory that the faithful will receive if they remain faithful and upright. Now, this is a teaching. What I just said is only a teaching from and by the Orthodox Church, if understood properly, right? I don't know exactly how the papal Protestant world would ex explain this, but theologically, if you don't understand and accept and embrace the teaching of the divine energies, St. Gregory Palamas and other saints have clearly presented, then you cannot talk about the faithful receiving the divine glory. Of course, the divine glory are the divine energies, the presence of God, and they are the deifying, glorifying energies of God. And that divine glory is not something that God keeps for himself, but he gives to those who love him. And we see them in the lives of the saints of every age, including our own. We see that divine glory. We see the uncreated light. People witnessed to this in many of the lives of the saints in the 20th century. They saw the uncreated light 
in St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, and Elder Ephraim of, of Philotheo in Arizona, and many other saints. St. Yakovos, many witnesses of the divine energy, the uncreated light, the glory of God shining forth in and through the saints. God wants this for every human being. This is salvation, total union and communion with God. That's the aim. Each one of us is called to that. No one, it's not just for five or 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever it is that God allow, uh, embraces every in every generation or manifests in every generation. There are many more who we never learn about, but it's for every one of us. And if we're not making progress in that, it's our problem or the sins of the world that have been uh, let's say visited upon us and we have been participants in so there are this divine glory of course is not always there and it's for those faithful who he says here remain upright remain faithful right so there are times when unfortunately the faithful succumb to difficulties scandals temptations persecutions right and we see that, for instance, the scandal of those who were following Christ. When he turned and said to them and spoke to them of the divine glory, what did he say? 653, John 653. He said, it's just one example in scriptures where we have the faithful not remaining until the end, not remaining faithful and upright until the end because they're scandalized. They trip and fall because of some scandal they can't understand. They use, in other words, their rational intellect, which is not the organ by which we commune and trust God, the heart, the spirit of man is, this is just for analysis purposes, for function in this world, and, that, and, and, and going through this world, reading, learning, growing, applying, however, and, and, and purifying and being in communion with God happens in the noose or the heart of man, the spirit of man. So, unfortunately, the rational... Intellect, the rationalism of every age is what oftentimes is the scandal, is the is the thing that trips us up, right? We trust that and not God. And it happened in the days of our Lord when he turned and said, if, you, if one does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, he does not have eternal life. And what happened? Well, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. They could not humble themselves and trust. They accepted the thoughts and the rational analysis of his words and did not crucify their intellect and accept his words as what coming from the master, the Lord himself. And to humble themselves and then experience would have taught them what that means. Instead, they wanted their intellect to, 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 to judge it. They wanted their, you know, their rational intellect to be the judge of his words, which is impossible. Understand that, brothers and sisters. If you allow that to happen, you will walk away from Christ. You will become a heretic or a schismatic or a deluded man of this world. You cannot approach the words of the Lord with that kind of arrogance and that kind of rationalism. Throw it away, right? Some of those people left forever and never returned to our Lord because they had been scandalized. And there will be many such scandals and have been. There will be many more in the days of the end of this world because they're going to say as i said where is god that'll be the great great temptation for christians where is god and so the lord in john 6 62 just before they walk away very interesting question he asked right the lord asked his disciples what if you were to see the son of man ascending where he was previously what's all that about talking about eating and drinking and he goes and he says many things that are scandalous for the rationalist and he says what would you say if you could see my glory that's what that means what would you say if you could see my glory it's really interesting this is the glory which is granted to the faithful as we said it's indicated by the angel who appears with the face shining like the sun so this is the meaning now we're getting back to the to the angel with the face shining like the sun what is all that about the Lord allows divine glory to peek through in order to strengthen the faithful of every epoch, every age. Through a variety of manifestations, through saints, through, through miracles that he allows, like the weeping icons that are amazing miracles in our day that give us consolation and, and, the, and the glory of God and, the, and the, uh, the, the other world peeks in, right? Such things help 
us and are precisely why the angel appears with a face like a, like the sun. Because the Lord told us we shouldn't forget that the faithful will shine in the kingdom of his father. So this is a this is a pledge and this is a message that, that, that this is what I desire for all of you. This, this glory, this shining, this light to shine forth from every one of you, to be my presence in your life. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's what that's all about. Communing, partaking of the divine nature, as the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter says in his epistles. Without that, we have no life in us, he says, without that. An angel from heaven legs as pillars of fire. What's all this about? His feet or legs as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a book having been opened. And he set his foot, the right one, on the sea and the left one on the land. All right. You see the image from the, the, the holy monastery of Dionysius on Mount Athos. You see that on the left. You see this cloud, this angel. You can't see the scroll on the left, but we'll see that in a bit. And these two legs as pillars of fire, as pillars of fire coming out. Very interesting. According to St. Arethrus, these great fiery legs or feet serve no other purpose than to punish the impious. And the punishment will be according to their burning rather than an illuminating quality. So they both burn and they illuminate these pillars of fire, right? And this is very consistent with the whole patristic theology understanding of not only uh, this world, but the next. In other words, not only our participation or not in the divine energies and glory and light in this world, but what is eternity? Eternity is, again, the presence of God. The question is, of course, our stance. That's what determines what we will be in eternity. God is both fire and light at the same time. He illumines but he burns much like the sun, right? The sun illumines, but if you are out there in the middle of the day, you're going to get burnt from the sun. The sun is light, which illumines, but it can burn as well, right? The righteous in the kingdom of God receive the illuminating attribute of divine glory emanating from Jesus Christ. So the righteous, the holy, those who love the glory of God, who desire with all their heart, those who have communion with God, they receive the light and they become illumined. What happens to those who don't receive the light and are not illumined? That's they're still going to participate. They're still going to be recipients of the of the sun, the burning uh, sun, right? The light uh, of God. Uh, it says in twenty two five later on that the night shall be no more. They need no land light of or lamp. Uh, I'm sorry, light of lamp or sun, right? So this is Christ's divine glory. It will now replace the created lights. All the created lights will cease, and the divine glory of Christ will replace the sun. There shall, there shall be no more night in that world to come. Divine glory fills all things everywhere in the created world. Everywhere present and fills all things. It also reaches Hades. Or hell, because it's a part of the created world. Of course, God is present there. But in hell, his presence is felt as fire that burns. The only thing that's uncreated is God, right? So everything else is created. So God is present there in hell, in what has been prepared for the demons, not for man. His presence is there, but what is going on there? It's like in the middle of an Arizona day, you're getting burned. It's a fire that burns. It's not a light that illumines. What determines that? Our disposition, our stance. The burning quality of divine glory reaches hell, but not the illuminating quality. In other words, it doesn't reach there because there's no one that's receptive, receptive of it. There's no one who desires it. They didn't, they didn't choose it. They didn't want it. They didn't love it. What reaches the righteous is only what illumines and does not burn, whereas the impious receive only what burns and does not illumine, right? There's one way to put it. There's many ways to put this, and there's many patristic references to this. But this is very, very important for us to understand, both in this world and the next. What is the nature of light and life? 
darkness and death. Like, what? How does that work? What in relation to God? So we can say, although this is not Elder Athanasius saying it, but this is from other writings, hell is the love or light of Christ rejected, right? It's the grace of God, the love of God rejected. That's what hell is. And what when we reject love, we are in a kind of hellish state, aren't we? Right? We're not in like communion. We're not in peace. We don't have peace. We don't have communion with the person. We reject. If we, somebody loves us and we say, get away from me. I hate you. That hatred is our hell, not the other person's. So already in this life, we see all of this foretold, fore, foreshadowing the eternal world, eternal reality, right? In essence, the darkness of hell is much greater, many times darker than what we know darkness to be. So this, this created darkness is nothing compared to the darkness of hell. In the same place, however, the presence of the inextinguishable fire burns without giving off any light because it is the divine will for it to do so. So this is this is what not God's will. He doesn't will anyone to be lost, but this is the, the way that the relationship will be depending on our stance, right? This is how it will be. God, God's presence cannot be removed from, from hell because it would cease to exist, right? There would cease to, so th there are those who want uh, humanity just cease to exist, but guess what? It's not going to happen. You will always exist. Afterwards, all bodies will rise. All of them will be restored. Souls and bodies will be restored of every human being. When we say Christ is risen, we don't mean just for the faithful. For every human being, Christ is risen. And those bodies and those souls, you reunited, depending on what they loved or didn't, they will enjoy eternity. And if you didn't love love, if you didn't love God, if you didn't love truth, you won't have communion with that eternally. And that will be a darkness and a burning that will not end. Unfortunately, it will not end because... There was a time that was given for repentance. And repentance cannot happen when there is a separation of the body and the soul during and before the, the judgment. And when the judgment comes, that is what we've chosen. You know, we will be where we chose to be. When the angel stands on the earth and the sea, now we're moving to the next section. A little getting ahead of it. This is what we're going to talk about next. When the angel stands on the earth and the sea, what is that all about? It means that he has come to punish all the impious of the earth with the burning quality of divine glory. So again, that's the imagery here. The authority of God is coming. Those, the call to repentance has been given. The authority is coming. The judgment is coming. And it, depending on what we loved and chose, we will be either with or without communion. St. John, now let's talk a little bit. Very interesting. This picture you have is of the actual uh, cave of the revelation. All right, we're looking at the island of Patmos and we're looking out from it. And I wanted to give you a sense of what the saint would have seen when he looked out and as he was in the midst of this vision. What he, of course, he, it was an, almost a deserted island at that point, right? There were not all these houses and everything, it was just a but he could see, I've been myself to this cave, and you stand on this hill, it's not all the way up to the top of the hill, but it's about halfway up, and you see the whole expanse, all the way from north to south, and all to the west, you see all of the island. And it is a, just a beautiful, beautiful place, but you can, you can sense when he's talking now, why uh, what he's looking at right and why he's, what he's seen the purpose of the angel's stance on the land and the sea means that the angel has been given authority to punish all on land and sea it shows christ's sovereignty over the entire earth um uh, it's uh it's 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 a very interesting that saint john had the vision where he had it it was not an accident he was exiled to Patmos, and not it wasn't an accident. It wasn't against God's will. Christ arranged for this. Christ allowed it, in other words. Uh, and it was not out of weakness, but out of his providential care for St. John, that he would have it at this place. It was 
appropriate that he would be at this place to see this. And part of it is what we're seeing here, this vision of the land and the sea, right? So you have him standing on the sea and then on the land. He's seeing this, as it were, in front of us on the island, looking out to the sea, looking at the land, and he's envisioning this before him. Now, <clears throat> Revelation um, goes on. I mean, this uh, section goes on in the book of Revelation. And there's an open scroll that's mentioned. And here you can see in the image that I've got before you, exactly this from the Monastery of Dionysio, the, the hand coming out and the scroll. And it's open and has words on it. And St. John there down below is receiving the scroll. The scroll which the angel holds contains the remaining mysteries, which will be revealed in Revelation and are the things which will take place from that point until the end. So this is not like the previous scroll. It's open and revealed. The previous scroll was not open and revealed in the same way. This is, this is the portion, one portion of the things to be revealed. And since St. John will write about these things, it is not necessary for the scroll to be sealed. It is open. The angel appears to be saying that St. John will prophesy about the things to follow. So we have that there in the iconography of the monastery of Dionysio. So, in 10.3 now, we're going to go through 10.4, so we're not too far from the end. Thank you for your patience. We're already an hour and a half in. It always blows me away how quickly the time passes. I look at the clock and say, it's an hour and a half, or at least an hour and 15 minutes, because we do have a 15-minute introduction. Still, it goes very quickly. 10.3 uh, now, he cried with a loud voice, even as the lion roareth. And when he cried, the seven thunders spoke their own sounds. Cry here is necessary to strike fear. Why is there? Why is he crying out? Well, it's going to strike fear in the people. And why does it need to strike fear in the people? Because in order for the people to repent, because that's that's what the aim of everything is, to bring people to return. What is repentance? Return to communion. So the whole of the economy of salvation is for one reason, to repent. Just as an aside here, when you don't hear preaching it on repentance, when you don't hear priests, bishops calling for repentance, big problem, big problem with them, with us as clergymen. That should be a constant call, constantly. We should be talking about repentance, but we need to explain it. We need to talk about it as it is. It's a positive, wonderful thing. Repentance is not some, some terrible, dark, uh, you know, damning I don't know what has gone in the Protestant, was it the Protestant fundamentalists that have given this impression? I don't know where we get this. It is, it is the beginning of the gospel. It is the call to repentance. It is the hope of repentance. It's all there, right? Return. That's what repentance means. It means a reorientation to go back to God and communion with God. So it is necessary here with this method to strike fear in people precisely because that's the only thing left in for many of us, if we're going to repent, the fear of God, of course, not the fear of a vaccine or a, vi a virus to, in order to get a vaccine, but the fear of God. And so that's the reason, main reason, one of the main reasons why there's a cry with a loud voice, even as the lion roars. He wants to show just how impressive that is and how, how it comes down and it shocks you, right? So this is what is, is being described. And this, the number seven is used here to show fullness always in Scripture. And the thunder in Scripture is always understood to be the voice of God. God himself is speaking here. All right? He, he cried, but the Lord is speaking through uh, the uh, angel. And the voice came from heaven, as we see in John 12, 28 to 29. Why do we say, for instance, one example, that the thunder is a voice and the voice of God, because we have right there in the gospel. I have glorified it, the voice said, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing by heard it and said that it had thundered. So thunder is a way that they, they describe the voice. That's what it reminds them of in this in, in the gospel, but that's also what it seems like to John, uh, that there were seven thunders spoke their words. Interesting. Fascinating and, and just imagery is amazing. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, he says. And I heard a voice out of the heavens say, Seal up the things which the seven sp thunders spoke and do not begin to write them. Hmm. 
So I was about to speak, or about to write, rather. So, the, so St. John's there with a pen and pencil, or whatever it would have been at the time of St. John. It would have been some kind of uh, bird's feather with some ink or something. And uh, he was about to write, and the Lord stopped him. Now, usually in holy tradition, we have an image of him dictating the whole thing to his disciple. Uh, but in this case, we have him actually writing it. And it might have been both, actually. He might have written and taken notes, so to speak, and then he would have dictated the whole thing back uh, to his disciple. So here we see that this knowledge is being withheld from all of us, but it's given to John. It's only meant for John. That there is some knowledge that needs to be withheld. Not everything should and needs to be learned. Now that's the revelation of Jesus Christ did not give every last thing. We have some things that are not given, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then there are other things that are not written in the gospel according to St. John's gospel. Right? They, it wouldn't be impossible to write it all in. The, what was written is for our, our sake and our salvation. Uh, there were many, many other things that could have been written, but they were not written. So there is knowledge withheld, and it's proper to do so. Contrary to what other people believe wrong, wrongly, the scriptures that are written, not the ones that are given orally, in other words, all the events that were passed on and all of the knowledge was passed on from the apostles to the disciples all the way down to our day. There are, unfortunately, many Christians who believe that only the written part of the gospel is what's important. That's really mistaken, very, very mistaken. There is an oral tradition. There are things that were not written. There are things that are passed on that are extremely important, equally important, that the church has maintained and kept in its bosom for these 2,000 years. And so there are things that are not going to be told to us. And there's a speculation here uh, that this might, this, that, that which was withhold, withheld might have been the dreadful punishment for the impious, which would terrify even the faithful if it had been known to them. So there are things that should not be said because it will not be profitable for us spiritually. Uh, by the way, that happens in our life too, right? There are things that should not be said. We could say a lot of things to our brothers and sisters and our family, our parishioners. They don't all have to be or all should be said. There needs to be discernment. And so here we have things that should not be said. Now, there are some things that are best for people not to know, he says. Man cannot cope with all knowledge, uh, wisely uh, said. So what are some of the things that God withholds? Well, the time of our death, the end of the world, the name of the Antichrist. We know the number. We don't know his name. We know the number of his name, but not his name. So there are a few things right there in the book of Revelation that are withheld. Uh, and if we were told the time of our death, it would be a terrible thing, right? It would be a life of martyrdom. We would be living always with expectation of the day of our death. Uh, it would not be profitable for us. Or there would be people who would say, well, I'll live a licentious life, and then I'll repent at the end, and like the thief, I'll enter paradise, and that would not be profitable either. So it would be unprofitable, dreadful spiritually speaking, if we knew the hour of our death. It would not help us. We would not be mindful in, uh, of the day of our death in a positive, helpful way. Uh, a, a, a multifaceted plan of God is served in his great wisdom by us not knowing the time of our death. Now, some people might take objection to that. They have some kind of bright ideas. We need to accept that that's the case. And that's, that's, that's how God arranged it. And, there's, and it's for us and for our salvation that he does that. Now, there's an interesting reality here in this, uh, in this exchange. There's a hidden message that's not being shared. It's only shared with John. There's a silence here about the events that are not going to be shared to the, to the, to the readers. Uh, only an insinuation. Only an insinuation. And, and God here is protecting us from an unhealthy curiosity. St. Erethrus says the following, referring it to St. John, seal this and keep it secure in your mind, he says, as if talking to St. John. Do not make it known at all in your writings. Maybe it is best for this knowledge not to be presented or revealed before the presence of the last days. And so there is this idea that maybe that will be revealed in the last days. I don't know 
if that's what St. Arthur's meant here, but it's certainly not going to be revealed until the events themselves come. And that's na- that's the nature of things, is that a lot of these things are not going to be understood and not going to be interpretable until they actually begin to happen. Uh, there's an example in the Old Testament of Daniel. And it's very instructive here, and it's it, it, it's important, and it dovetails nicely with the book of Revelation. And that is the following in 12, 9 to 10. The Lord tells Daniel, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. And he means here that the words will not be revealed until the necessary time passes. Many shall choose to be made white and refined through fire, but the lawless shall act lawlessly. Wow, this is just everything in Scripture just talks to the to our day, to our time, to the reality of what's going on around us. There are those who are lawless and will be lawless until the end. And there are those who are being purified and refined through fire, the fire of temptations, the fire of repentance, right? That's what's happening. Those who are on the path of salvation, those who are on the path of damnation. He says, none of the lawless shall understand. There are those who just will not understand. They are determined to live their life unto damnation. And they are free to do that because you can't love with uh, without freedom. It doesn't exist. So, But he says the wise, the wise will understand. So we must pass through this fire and become whitened, sanctified. We must be tested. If you want to be a disciple, you want to be saved, you want to be purified, you must be tested. You must pass through the fire. And those who have the disposition to do that because of the love for Christ, they love Christ, they understand he is the truth incarnate, and they love him, they will go through all of that to be in communion with him, they will become more holy. And those who do not will become more impious. It says there in scripture later on, uh, eti, uh, go uh, more and more to holiness, those who are holy and those who are not to impiety and, and, and sinfulness. And so the, the only, according to Scripture, only the godly will understand. Holy Scripture and the prophecies are locked for the ungodly. The ungodly will never understand. They stand in arrogance anyway, and they look at the Scriptures, and they reject the proper understanding of Scriptures. There's even, unfortunately, many who call themselves Christians who do not want to humble themselves at the feet of the great saints and elders and interpreters of the Scriptures, but they think they know better. And they also, unfortunately, tragically, The scriptures are closed to them, and they will not understand. You must sit at the feet of the saints to understand scripture, brothers and sisters. Do not read it without the Holy Fathers. You will not understand. That is the way the the Lord has arranged things. That's how he desires it, because we all humble ourselves in that way. You can't sit there as the unfortunate Protestant Bible-only mentality is. I will open this up, and I will understand the mysteries. You can see here. In this book of Revelation, how much interpretation is necessary, how much we need the saints to interpret, and we need the scriptures, and we need uh, all the examples uh, to understand this, the scriptures. So, uh, unfortunately, there will be those who will not understand, the ungodly, the unrepentant, the proud, the arrogant. They will allow themselves to be stamped with the number of the beast, the 666, and they will not recognize what they have done. What a tragedy. The ungodly will remain without understanding. This is what we are seeing here in both scriptural passages. So the the example of Daniel, again, to go on, is that the scriptures are a closed book to the impious, to the non-believers. And they look down at it and they say, oh, it's just a code of ethics and laws. The New Testament is just another code, a newer code of ethics and laws, right? Just moralism. It's just, what's the point? Who cares? Um, They don't understand the eschaton and the relationship of everything to the coming world. And they, 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 they lose the ultimate meaning of it all. They become nihilists. They become narcissists. Scripture is looked upon as old and irrelevant. But for the faithful, Scripture is life. Scripture is life. It shows, it prepares, it announces, it points to the kingdom of God. All these things, my friends, are, this is the elder talking, are markers only for the faithful, only for those who have the Holy Spirit, only for those who have, uh, who are in the body of Christ and have the Holy Spirit, who open their eyes to see. What does the Lord say in Scripture many times? For those who have eyes to see. For those who have eyes to see. 
Truly, truly, I say, for those who have eyes to see, this is what we truly pray with all our heart and for all of us to have. We beg God, beg God, like St. Gregory Palamas, enlighten my darkness, beg God. Ask him on your knees, with your prostrations, in your prayer corner, enlighten my darkness, open my eyes, give me to understand. Open the book of life to me, Lord. Each one of us has to cry out for this knowledge if we're going to enter more deeply. And that is it for this lesson, Lesson 5, Series 3, for our look at the Chapter 10, 1 to 4. All right. And we say, surely come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And he says, surely I come quickly. God help us to the prayers of our elder Athanasius. So if we have questions, we'll take them now. And over in Crowdcast, see a couple questions. And here, let's begin with the questions we have from John and the folks on Facebook. And uh, Let me get the scripture in front of me. That's one thing I want to do. So there we go. All right. The previous verses seemed focused on possible World War III. Could this angle be the one that identifies the sleeping marble king? Interesting. I'm not sure what you mean this angle identifies. I don't see in Scripture any reference directly, obviously, to the sleeping marble king. First of all, I have to explain that to people who do not understand. There is a uh, tradition coming down from us from Constantinople and Mount Athos and, um, and repeated by certain uh, holy uh, elders in our day that there will be a, a for a time, for a time, no one knows the exact time. Some people speculate it will be 30 years. I think it's all speculation but there will be a time in which uh there will be a restoration of the church's freedom and ability to do mission throughout the world that's ultimately what it's all about now it's co it's talked about in other terms but that's the reason why and the only reason why god would want to bring about the restoration of a orthodox emperor orthodox king uh to uh free the church up in order to do mission it's not to have a worldly power over the uh, Constantinople or, or any other uh, city. Uh, the, the whole purpose of that was always to preach the gospel and bring it to the four corners of the earth. And there is in Scripture a clear reference to this, that before the end, there will be a last preaching of the gospel. Uh, and then the end will come. And so there is there is this tradition handed down that uh, like uh, in the past times when there were the seven sleepers of Ephesus or uh, even uh, uh, other scriptural examples, the Lord brought those who had long been asleep in the Lord back. Prophet Elias and Prophet Enoch are said to come back. So it's not impossible, of course, for the Lord to do that. And there is a tradition that there will be a ruler again, that the church will have, uh, he'll be a very, very pious and holy man, and he will uh, be restored in Constantinople, and he will rule there. Uh, and there will be years in which the church will conduct a unfettered mission to the world. Uh, uh, as in the same time period, it is it is understood that there will be a continual uh, uh, progress and, and mystery of iniquity will continue, of course, and they will rise simultaneously. And, and, and uh, on one on the one hand, those who love and desire will follow after the Orthodox preachers of repentance and the uh, the anointed one, and those who continue in sin will follow after the evolving mystery of iniquity and the uh, people of this, uh, the rules of this world. But uh, how this ties in now with, in terms of World War III, I'm not sure what your question is. It's unclear to me what you're asking uh, beyond just previous... Could this angle be the one that identifies? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any clear reference, so I'm not sure... What else you're asking? Next question. How about people who claim they have been physically attacked or probed by aliens? Do they need an exorcism? Do Orthodox perform exorcisms like Catholics? So, uh, of course, there are exorcisms. There are exorcisms read uh, for every catechumen. They have exorcisms read before baptism, perhaps many times. And those who, of course, are possessed, exorcisms are read for them. Even those who are under the influence of demons. Uh, the, there are prayers written by St. Basil the Great, mainly. Uh, that are that are to exercise or 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 the prayers are for God 
uh, to drive out the demons from the people. Uh, but um, what you're asking is speculative. I don't know. It may or may not need exorcism, depending on what we're talking about. Uh, th there are the aliens that you're talking about are demons. So if people are just attacked by them, they probably don't need exorcisms. But if they're possessed by them, then yes, they would need exorcisms. If that's what you're asking, and it, it's possible that that level of delusion, if people are embracing the the aliens, in other words, demons, that they're at a, a gross level of delusion and they will need a great spiritual uh, health, restoration to health, repentance, return, and a long you know, process of purification. I don't know. It depends. Well, I mean, that would be a case-by-case -case analysis. Can we unknowingly invite an evil spirit into our lives? How can we know if a spirit is evil or not? So thank you for the question. Uh, you unknowingly invite him well, your, your life could invite him. In other words, you could be in delusion about things. Uh, you could be living for your passions, right? You could be living according to your, your sick desires. And, and, and the, behind the passions are the demons. And so if you live and obey all of these passions and, and exalt them, then you're basically identifying with the demons and their rebellion. And therefore, you could, you could you know, keep company with demons, you will you would keep company with demons they would they would find in you a place of repose so to speak right now whether you be possessed or not is a whole other question there are many people who are not possessed but who do the will of the demons and the, the evil spirits pretty regularly and and the, they don't need to be possessed to 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 be uh, counted among disciples of the demons so uh but unknowingly or unintentionally calling upon them i don't think so unless you're involved in some kind of a cult or or something and you think it's you think it's not demons but it's something else I, I mean you could be somebody could be very deluded and and be involved in some witchcraft or uh or or, or other occult uh practices and think they're not calling on demons and yet they are and they could be possessed yes i think that's theoretically possible uh but as far as discerning the spirits that's exactly what happens in the church and by those people who are in the church. So if you make progress in the spiritual life, you repent, you're purified, you're initiated into the life of the church, then you're given exactly that. That's what separates the church and the saints from all the world, the discernment of spirits. In other words, what is from God and what is not from God. That presupposes an experience of the of God, right? So I, I can speak from experience because I have a relationship and a communion and a knowledge, a personal knowledge of God, I can experience just like anything else. Like if you have a lot of experience in a particular art or or, or a particular uh, uh, you know work of some sort, you're going to be able to speak from experience. You're going to be able to immediately identify things that other people who don't have the experience cannot understand, right? So that that's what that's what's presupposed in discerning the spirits. Like you're saying, presupposes you have a lot of experience. Uh, of of uh, of the Holy Spirit, and then you understand what is not the Holy Spirit, right? But if you only are in the realm of the fallen spirits and you don't have experience of the one Holy Spirit, then you will not easily discern the difference, right? You will not discern if you're being deceived. Last week, uh, this is Ladybug. Last week, you said that demonic possession is less common than in the past because these days people invite the demons in willingly. Well, they, they follow the demons. I don't think I would say they invite them in willingly. If you're inviting the demons to possess you, I suppose they could. <laughs> At that point, you're, the door is wide open. I just said that they're not, I don't think they're, it's necessary for their, their task and their work to possess necessarily. They have people freely living for their passions. And so those people are going to join them uh, in, you know, in non-communion, right? They're already in the state of of uh, egotism and 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 living like the demons, right? Total rebellion. So at that point, I don't think they need to somehow possess them to achieve their goals. But that doesn't mean people are not they're not being possessed today. There certainly are. Uh, you say a person with out of control passions is that actually a form of demons being invited in? It's not invited in. When you use that 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 terminology or that phrase, it's giving this idea of possession, right? I said possession can be understood as like a a, a many 
a two or three story house with many rooms and the demon essentially takes over one of your rooms, right? And it says, I'm going to live here and you can't do anything about it and you can't evict him. That's kind of how you can understand how it's how he he's dwelling within the house of the soul. Now, that's exceptional for most in most cases, right? Unless because there's only so many demons, right? So there's there's seven billion people. So um, but they don't need to do that to have people go and follow them into non-communion and outside of and far from the light, right? And so if you live for the passions, you live in them and for them and you don't struggle against them. You know, I mean, just, I don't know, you can imagine, right? I don't need to go through all the sins of that people commit today. They literally go from one pleasure the, the seeking uh, venture to another, and it's all egotistically focused. And some of them maybe are not very destructive, but others are very destructive, whether it be all the various addictions. So if you if you live for that and you enslave yourself to those desires, you're already following after the demons, right? You're already... A, a, far from God. Um, intra entrenched bad habits is not a form of demonic possession. Is that why I wouldn't say that? No, you're asking me, is it a form of demonic possession? Uh, it, have we invited upon ourselves? Yes. Those, those entrenched bad habits, and that sounds pretty innocuous, but we're talking about serious, you know, passions that we've become enslaved to, we've cultivated, right? Um, you know, if you love money and you, you just spend your whole day, like, how can I make more money? And you love it and you, and you just revel in the idea that I'm going to, I'm going to blow $3,000 on this. And, uh, and then you're going to, you know, whatever that is, that love of money, love of the created order in a distorted, disordered way is a passion. You are a slave. And, and at that point, you're not going to enjoy the presence of the spirit of God. It's not good. It's, those things are inconsistent. They cannot coexist uh, internally, right? Now, the, the, that doesn't mean God gives up on you. He's constantly trying to bring you to repentance, and he's guiding you from outside, as it were. But you, with your actions and your habits and your way of life, have shut him out, right? And so at that point, what do you resemble? The demons. That's what the demons have done. They've, they've, they've shut God out. They've shut the light out. They've turned away from it. They don't want to return. They don't want to repent. And if, if that's how you live, you're you're already in the realm and the and the, you know, uh, let's say the communion, so to speak, uh, in 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 the sense of doing what they do, imitating them and not imitating uh, the the saints and the angels who worship God. They don't worship themselves; they worship God. And so, I wouldn't call it demonic possession. I would say that it's a um, it's a willfulness, an egotism that. That is like, like the demons, right? You have a likeness with demons, so you're not like God, but the opposite of, of that, which is uh, self love. All right, next. What are your thoughts on the relationship, the relation between Zechariah chapters three to four and the two witnesses in Revelation eleven? Do these holy texts unite prophecy of the two olive trees and two lampstands? I don't know. We'll we'll answer that when I don't do this. Uh, as in, maybe this is the first time you come here. I don't do exegesis on the fly, but I will. I will. Ha I'm happy to take it and put it aside and look at it again. That's what I'll tell you when we get to that. Uh, we're not there, and when we get to that, we'll talk more about it. Uh, but so I don't. I don't normally. Uh, if I did I save that? No, I don't know. Somehow I have to come back and get that. So a good question, but I'm not going to answer it right now. Uh, I have been told by an Orthodox priest that God has no wrath. Uh, it depends what he means. It depends what he means. We use that term a lot in Scripture. Uh, so God's wrath, uh, what he wants to say, of course, he's not passionate, if that's what he wants to say. That's what I'm understanding. God has not become angry. We say God's anger, but these are all, I said this last week, I think, or two weeks ago, anthropomorphistic in other words we take the forms the, the, the like human human uh interactions and human passions and human uh stances and we project them on god obviously god is not like that right so but we in order to describe what we see in scripture the the prophets and the saints they're describing something so we can understand it right so they take it just like saint john here is continually using imagery from the created world 
but of cr- uncreated and 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 heavenly realities. So it was like this, right? He doesn't say it was. It wasn't actual dove. It was like a dove, right? The Holy Spirit. So in the same way here, uh, we use these terms and we talk about God in ways that obviously cannot imply and do not imply that he is impassioned. <laughs> that would be impossible if he's God. So in, in that sense, he has no wrath. In the sense that, do we talk about God's wrath? Of course we do. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that the fruits of our sin, essentially, and what has been allowed by God, ultimately, even that, his wrath, is meant for our return, is meant for our salvation. Because in Scripture, it says very clearly, he desires that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So he's not a respecter of person. He wants all to be saved. That's why he was crucified for every last human being to be with him. So it would be impossible to imagine that God, that same God, being desiring of some to send people to hell or sending people to hell. That that's totally incongruous. So you have to understand the whole picture of God, all of His revelation, and then interpret the parts and pieces and words used in that context, and not try to go backwards. And start at the end with the words used and then try to figure out the big picture and the economy of salvation and the person of God, right? Does that make sense? I hope hope that makes sense. So yes and no. He doesn't have wrath in the sense of being impassioned and being angry and all the rest. And yet there is God's wrath, and that is the fruit of our sin. What happens when we turn away from him? It's all built in, but it's all ultimately meant for our salvation. And so it's an expression of God's love. Father, could you explain the following John 5, 24? Maybe. I don't do exegesis on the fly, but we'll see. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come in judgment, but has passed. Does this mean the saints won't be judged? Uh, So what is judgment? Judgment is a separation. It means to be separated. So if you're not coming into judgment, it means you're in communion. Well, you are in communion. He who hears my word and believes on me, what does it mean to believe the one who sent me? To entrust yourself. That belief is not to accept him. I believe he exists. I believe, you know, I have a friend, John. I believe John exists. Of course he exists. He's right there. No, I entrust John, right? That's what that means there. So those who hear and entrust in, are obedient, are disciples, right? Christ, the one who has been sent, has eternal life. What do you mean has eternal life? The life of communion. It doesn't begin after death, but it's not like we die and then we begin eternal life. Eternal life is now, begins now. The minute that eternal life, Christ, came into time and space, he brought eternal life into this world. That's the whole life of the church. That's what the incarnation is all about, to give us now eternal life. So then when we we depart this life, it's a door. It's not an end. It's not a new beginning in the sense of that we don't we start eternal life after death. No, we simply continue in eternal life. Right? Eternal life is Christ himself. If you have, it's like redundant. If you have Christ, you have Christ. If you have eternal life, you have eternal life. You see, you see what I mean? If you have and you believe and you trust and you have communion with Christ, you have eternal life. Why? Because Christ is eternal life. He himself is eternal life. Communion in him is eternal life. So the judgment is not going to happen. Why? Because we're not going to be separated. We're already united. Judgment, it means to be separated. So yeah, judgment has been already done away with. We're not going to be judged. We're already united. So we're not going to be separated. Does that make sense? All right. It doesn't mean there won't be a general judgment for all humanity. It just means that it's already happened. You already have died. Let me put it another way. You're already spiritually, you've overcome the death that has been separated from God. You're not you're not dying spiritually when you die. The body, soul leaves the body, and that is a death, a physical death, but the soul is united to God, so it continues to be united to God. Right? It's not separated. All right, next question. Father, is it sinful to desire to know about the things that weren't revealed? For example, the voice of seven thunders. 
Um, well, what is sin? Sin is a missing of the mark. And the minute that God says this is not revealed and you want to figure it out, then you're missing the mark because the mark is his will, right? So he does. He says, no, these things are going to be withheld. We should say, okay, let it be blessed. And we saw that there's some good things about that should be re not revealed, right? The, the hour of our death, the end of the world. Those things are not revealed for a good reason. So we should just trust God and say, let it be blessed. I don't need to know those things. Next question. How do we stay humble while at the same time not falling into self-loathing? Well, humility is simply being in the truth. And if you loathe yourself and you were created in the image of God, that's not a that's not truth. I mean, it's not good. That's not what God desires. That's not uh, a blessing, right? Self-loathing, in the sense that you're using it, is not seen within ourselves that we are created in the image of God and He loves us. So we don't love our passions. We don't love our sinfulness, our missing of the mark. We don't love our our passions, but we love the person. We love Christ, who in whose image we're made, and we rejoice that we are His creation. And if we're adopted sons, we rejoice that we've been redeemed and received into the body of Christ. And so those things are totally incompatible with being in the truth, right? Humility. What is humility? recognizing the truth about myself, the world, everything, right? What is pride? A delusional state in which I think I'm something that I'm not, right? So truth and humility are like this. And if you're self-loathing, you're not in truth because God, you, what you're, you're in delusion, right? Why would you loathe yourself uh, in terms of like your essence, your being, who you are, right? If you loathe the old man in you, the passions in you, the sins that you commit, that's a good thing. You should hate sin, not the sinner, not yourself, but the sin, the thing that separates you from God. You should hate the thing, not the person, right? So these things are incompatible uh, to, to, to be self-loathing and to be humble. Those are totally unconnected. Why do so many churches and monasteries use liturgical languages that only a small handful of people actually understand? Also, why do so many Greeks believe that ancient Greek is the most beautiful language? Do you agree with their, their sentiment? <laughs> you want to set me up, don't you? <laughs> with all my Greek friends and my, my Greek relatives. <laughs> Look, uh, it's, a long, it's a long story here. You've asked me, you know, we want me to get off on a big tangent. Uh, uh, the Orthodox Church, let me just say this first and foremost, has never embraced the idea, embraced by the Latins in the Middle Ages, that there's some sacred language that everybody has to pray in and live in, right? Latin for whatever, 600 years was embraced as the language or even longer. Uh, and we never embraced that. In fact, we fought against it in our mission to the Slavs. And we translated, we created a language based on the Greek by the great missionaries called Slavonic, in order to unite the Sla Slavic peoples in the worship of God and to translate into that language the divine services and everything like that. It was, it was, it was a creation by God, God's inspiration for the salvation of the people in those parts of the world, far from believing they had to all learn Greek. So the Orthodox Church does not believe and not teach that in the mission field, we must do uh, our mission in any language, particular language, whether it be Slavonic or whether it be Greek. I've heard opinions on both, by the way. I've heard people talk about Slavonic as a uh, language fell from heaven and that everybody has to learn Slavonic if they're going to truly worship God or something like that. I mean, these things, unfortunately, creep in. I cannot embrace these ideas. I think they're very strange and foreign to what the, the tradition tells us, the saints tell us. Uh, you know, Father Cosmas of Gregorio, for instance, a great missionary in our day, he left his uh, uh, homeland. He left his monastery in Mount Athos. He went into the heart of Africa in Congo. He worked for 25 years or whatever it was it, as a missionary there. I think it was 10,000 people were baptized, and, and the whole whole local church was established, uh, essentially. Now they have several bishops um, and, and tens of thousands of, of faithful. Uh, what did he do? Did he go around and tell everybody in the villages in the middle of Congo that they had to learn ancient Greek? Of course not. Did they end up doing some services in Greek? Yeah, even to the day. You can hear Greek in the middle of Congo. But the vast majority of their prayers and everything is offered in Swahili. 
uh, the chanting is Swahili. The, the services are all translated in Swahili. One of the great missionaries of our day, Father Damaskinos of Gregorio, great and prolific translator into many languages. He knows many languages. In Swahili, he translated everything and continues to translate. So the Orthodox Church, whether it be in Africa or in Alaska or whatever, is a missionary church. We translate it into Lucian. We translate it into English. We translate it into all the languages of the world. We're, we're in the process of doing translations from ancient Greek into English and f and then from English into other languages. Right now, we're, we're going to be working, hopefully, with people to translate into a variety of languages uh, the books we're publishing. So just to be very clear, that's the Orthodox Church's dogmatic and, and ecclesiastical consciousness. Now, the, the, the reality of, the, of the, in, the world of immigrants, whether it be America, Canada, Australia, whatever, where you had in the 20th century a phenomenon of immigration out of Orthodox lands, really, un, it was unprecedented. They brought not just um, first and foremost. First and foremost, they didn't bring the church with them. That was not like they weren't missionaries to America. So they came as Greeks, deter, determined to remain Greek in their language and identity, and all the rest. And that was not a bad thing in this melting pot, right? It's not a bad thing to, to maintain your identity. It's a good thing. Uh, so now here in America, Greeks, whatever it is, Bulgarians, Romanians, all the various Orthodox people, of course, there's there's a two track thing going on, right? There's a maintain your identity and yet do mission work to the to the people around you, and oftentimes the mission work suffers because they they give priority to maintaining their identity, and there has to be more wisdom, more discernment, I think, on the part of everyone to understand that those two things have to work together. Right, they cannot work against each other. They can, and they should work together. Uh, now, going more deeply to try to answer your question, forgive me. I have, I don't know what it is. I get this like itch on my face, and I'm constantly wanting to itch myself. Uh, it's annoying. Uh, so, going back to your question, the, the the liturgical languages are maintained in some places uh, in monasteries, for instance for liturgical and pastoral reasons that are unique to the monastery. The monasteries are not preaching everyone should do everything in ancient Greek. In fact, their mission, missions started around monasteries. I know personally several that are fully in English and they're supported by the monastery. So I think we have to understand that there's a monastery is kind of a unique situation. It's a family. And if the abbess and abbots and, 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 and monastics all have prayed all their life in Greek and, and, and their, most of the monastery is dedicated to Greek. This is kind of like somebody's household, right? You're gonna walk into their household and say, look, you gotta start speaking another language, no. The problem is that for many of us is that we love going to the monastery and we wanna participate in their worship and their the divine liturgy. And it's hard for us to do that obviously in ancient Greek. And so there's the, and there they also feel. I mean, there's there's a it's it's not just that they arrogantly say, well, we don't care. No, they they're very compassionate and they want people to go deeper into the faith. So I, I don't know how to, it's a very long discussion. I mean, we could have a whole class on this, all the their various aspects to try to understand this unique thing in the history of the church that is the the, the so-called diaspora, right? And how that pastorally should be dealt with. There should definitely be in, an increase into the mission work of the church, which is what we're doing. I mean, we're, our whole struggle is to do mission work in English and teach in English and all the rest, obviously. So there needs to be much more of that. And from these sources of great spiritual life, which are the monasteries and other places. At the same time, we have to respect the need for continuity and for this thing to happen over a long period of time, a transition and so that orthodoxy is extremely rich and there's a lot of things that need to be maintained. And it's not, it's not something that can quickly happen, this transition and this, this imparting of the holy tradition. It takes time and we have to be patient. Uh, and it's, I, I guarantee you it's a long struggle. I've been doing it for 30 years and I understand why people get frustrated. Uh, but we have to do our best to, 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 be, to go deeper in understanding the whole complexity of the situation. Um, I don't know. Greeks believe ancient Greek is the most beautiful language because that's what they know and love. And and, and there's a, there's a you know a good case to be made that that ancient Greek is an amazing and unique language. 
uh, and has been revered and learned around the world uh, by all educated people for a long, long time. I mean, that it's not it's not unknown, right? So there's probably some reason why they believe that. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of a case to be made that it is a an amazing and important language for people who uh, to learn if they want to read all the classics and the patristic writings in the original. They need to learn uh, ancient Greek. Um, but it's it's a testimony to their love of their own uh, language and 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 the culture. I don't think I, th I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. If they become chauvinistic about it, then that's a problem. If they become uh, Fight, philatistic about it, that's a problem. But just to love their language is a good thing. All right. I, I think I answered that. There's so many more questions tonight. And oh my gosh, there's like 15 more questions. So we're going to have to keep going. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let me just see how many questions we got over there. Next question. Should, should one say, God bless you, it seems prideful, what is correct to say? Okay. Um, it is a phrase that we hear all the time in English. In, in Greek, uh, you don't hear that as much in the same way, God bless you, Theos nesevoli If you do hear that, that's from a cleric, in the, or a priest or a bishop. Uh, I, I often... Um, cringe a bit when I hear laymen tell me as a priest, God bless you, not because it's a bad thing to say, it's a wonderful thing to say, and not because they don't mean very well, they do. But in the Orthodox Church, the place of the priest and the place of the bishop is very unique. And in a community, you will never hear that in uh, in, in a Greek village or a Greek society. You, know, you won't hear lay people tell the priest, God bless you. They'll always ask the blessing of the priest. They'll always recognize the unique role of the priest. They'll always, uh, it's not clericalism. It's it's the reverence for the holy priesthood, which is tremendous in a traditional Orthodox community. Uh, so I would say um, you can you can say those sentiments. Those are very good sentiments. Uh, um, maybe change it slightly to say, uh, you know, may. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of wishes in Greek. In Greek, we have so many wishes for every little thing, like, you know, good strength and good enlightenment. I mean, there's always kali fotisi, good enlightenment. There's all kinds of things you can wish for somebody, uh, and they do. Uh, uh, but the Lord bless you is a priestly wish and blessing, and or God bless you. So I don't know what to say. I don't know what to replace it with in English. Um uh, but I, you know, it's not. If, I guess for lay people to lay people, it's not a problem. But I would say it's a problem to say it to priests. We, it's not. It's not the way the church has understood things and the hierarchy of things and the, and the nature of things for two thousand years. I don't think it's something. I don't know in Russian. It'd be good. I never asked a Russian speaker. What do they say? Do they say the people say to priests, "God bless you"? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, may God, may God help you. We, is a good thing to say. May God, uh, I pray, I pray God's, you know, God be with you is something you could say. Um, uh, many people say in the Orthodox world, may the, may the Holy Theotokos uh, be, your, be your intercessor, be your guide, be your, you know, helper uh, or the saints. So uh, there's a variety of things you can say, but yeah. Why even, uh, why even after I confess, do I still feel guilty about certain things? Well, that's probably, I don't know, there's a variety of things. That's probably because you have not truly trusted God's forgiveness for you. And I find a lot of people like that. They, they beat themselves up over things that have happened last year, five years ago, 10 years ago. And they carry it around with them and they say, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. And I, they can't get over that. And that's actually a lack of trust in God. Like, do you believe in the mystery of confession? Do you believe that you are forgiven? Uh, now, there's also the possibility that you're not really repenting. You're not truly sorry and repenting and desiring to never go back to the pit, right? You're actually, I don't know. I, this is something I can't answer because I'm, I don't know. I don't know you, but uh, there are people who regularly go back to the vomit as St. John Chrysostom says, right? We vomit up things in confession. Then we go back and we 
eat it again. I mean, how disgusting is that? You can think, imagine that's what dogs do, right? So if you're like, if you go back to the vomit, you're like a dog. You know, you're not a you're not a, a, a man, a human being in the image and likeness of God. So that's a different issue, though. I don't think that's what you're talking about. That could be part of it, but it sounds like you need to trust God that you've been forgiven and you don't have enough of that, and you, you don't have experience of the mercy and love of God enough. Something you're keeping back. You're going to confession without abandoning yourself totally to God. Sounds like you're keeping back something. And that's why you're carrying that around with you. I don't know. Just some speculation. I don't know you. So it could be different. Uh, John Schultz, has there been a call for more missionary work from the elders? Of course, constant. I had never heard of Orthodox Christianity until a few years ago. Protestant Catholics seem to dominate the U.S. Well, we're a small group, first of all. We came very late. Uh, a, lot of a lot of people in the Orthodox Church who were in America did not come to be missionaries. They came to get a better life. And they brought the church... Uh, after them, uh, there's a, a big influx of Orthodox mission in the last 30 years, but I would say that we've been a small little ethnic group for, you know, various ethnic groups for about uh, 110, 20 years in America. Uh, so it, that's all been changing drastically and radically over the last 40 years. And it's understandable. Like if you under, if you actually get to know the history, you'll say, oh, that makes sense. Like it's not that I'm justifying anything. There's certainly sinful behavior uh, among a lot of Orthodox in terms of not being uh, mission-minded. I think that's that's not something that's radical to say. I think we understand that we have our uh, a worldliness and, and an indifference, and that's, you know, terrible. Uh, but I don't think that's the only explanation. I think that's just one of many. And there's historical reasons. There's, there's uh, practical reasons. Um, so, uh, but it's all changing drastically and radically in the last 30 years. I mean, I've seen it, I've been Orthodox 30 years. I've seen an explosion of conversions to Orthodoxy in the last 10 years, especially in the last five years. I mean, just things are out of hand in terms of people finding an Orthodoxy, a refuge from the world. Not, they didn't find it among the papal Protestants. They didn't find it among the reformed Protestants. They didn't find it in the world. They, they walk in an Orthodox church and they understand the spirit of God is present. Not, not always, but many times you hear stories like this more and more. So, uh, you know, thanks be to God. He's always doing missionary work, even if we're uh, slothful and lazy. But it, it is changing uh, radically in the last 20, 30 years. Next question. What do we say to people who ask, what is the point of striving to live righteously when the ones that do not live righteously can still be accepted if they find love for Christ at the end? Those people don't know who Christ is very well, if they think that that's how it works. First of all, there's a there's a deception and a and a, a cunningness in that whole thinking, which is not one not not of a son, right? This is somebody who is like a hired hand, and they want to get into heaven, you know, uh, stealing their way in, like like the, you know. I'm going to be like the thief and get in the last minute. Well, the thief didn't know that. <laughs> I guarantee you. He didn't bet on that. And if you're trying to bet on that, you're probably not going to be like the thief. So it's delusional. Uh, the question is, do you love truth? Do you love God? Do you love virtue? This is the question. Do you not? Okay, well, and you don't know when you're going to die. So it's really delusional to think, I'll just keep living sinfully, and then I'll repent. You don't know. You could die tonight. So bad idea. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Uh I would say, yeah, what's the point of striving? <laughs> because it's the point of our life. It's the meaning of our life. It's because we love truth and Christ and 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 it's life. Like you're not living if you're not str struggling for virtue. You're not alive. You're already half dead and you're already, you got a one foot in the grave. No, not in the grave, in hell. Like that's where you're, you're going. You are not going to deceive God. You're not going to trick him into getting to heaven. Like this is delusional. So I would say flee that kind of thinking. It's not virtuous. It's not the thinking of a son. It's not the thinking of a uh, somebody who loves. It's the thinking of somebody who's deluded and who is uh, very rationalistic, uh, and they don't have love. And uh, I hope to God that they do repent before the end, but they might not make it. Uh, when persecution starts, when the economy tanks like it's about to, uh, and they're, they're suffering you know, who knows what they're going to do? Because if you don't have virtue, you might end up doing a lot of things you didn't think you could. You were, uh, you were, you were uh, 
it's possible to do, right? You thought, oh, I'm a good person. And then without virtue, without grace, you end up doing terrible things. You, you think all those people who did heinous things in the history of the world thought they were bad people? They thought they were great. And they ended up doing things terrible because they didn't turn to God and, and repent and desire to be in communion with him. And as autonomous fallen human beings, they fell further. Not a surprise. So I think that that is, that is really tragic thinking. And uh, God forbid that you uh, entertain that. Anna, in a, in a reading by St. Paul to the Hebrews, it is said we must endure discipline as well as chastisement from our Lord. Indeed, chastisement is it's like what they say in Proverbs. The son who does not um, discipline is, is the father does not discipline his son, hates his son, right? Doesn't love his son because that's how you, you, you change and, and you grow and you get better. Um Yeah, discipline and chastisement are just two sides of the pedagogical coin. That's okay. Chastisement is not unto death, right? Chastisement is not, uh, if it's in the context of God's love, it's a beautiful thing. It's not what we think. It's not like, I'm going to beat you, okay? This is not a passionate God. It's always in the terms of return. So we accept whatever he gives because he, we know him as a loving God. So we're not afraid. Can demons and other, I hope that answers the question. I don't know. Can demons and other spiritual beings see our thoughts? No, they can't see your thoughts. But they've learned through so much experience, thousands of years, from even facial expressions and the way the eyes and everything, the whole stance of man, they've learned and they've seen again and again and again how people act and they become master psychologists. I mean, they inspired people like Freud. <laughs> they know how people, how man works psychologically. So when you're thinking things, it is betrayed many times in your actions, your thought. And then they, then they suggest things to you. And if you don't have any idea of how the spiritual life works, you believe thoughts that are not yours. Like how many people have written me and say, I have suicidal thoughts. And I say, they're not yours. They're not your thoughts. Why do you say you have them? They're not yours. No thought, no human being has ever generated a self-destructive thought. It's always a suggestion of the enemy, right? Because he's in the, you're in the image of God. God is life. It's impossible for, for somebody to generate from the depths of their soul a thought that is suicidal. It's always the enemy working with our arrogance, our lack of trust, our uh love of passions, those things work together. There's a synergy of demon and, and, and distorted human will that leads us down that path of self-destruction. I mean, certainly people take their own lives. I'm not saying that. But the origin of the thoughts are demonic. So going back to your thing, to your question here, um, they don't see our thoughts, but they've learned how we work, how we live, how we operate. And they they can guess, and they often guess very well, right? So that's why there's a whole emphasis. The heart of the Hesychastic Patrician tradition is this whole science of the spiritual life, which is dealing mainly with the demons and the passions. It's how to overcome them, how to war against them, how to resist them. And there's, a, there's so much literature on that. And it is, as you go deeper and deeper into the church, you're going to run into this literature, and you're going you're gonna to understand just how brilliant and, and inspired by God, the Holy Fathers are, and how deeply they understand the human condition and the demonic in the world. Uh, so hopefully I answered your question. Okay, next. Why is both hiras and pres presbyteros translated as priest? I don't know. That's a good question, because priest is certainly not... I mean, presbyter is pres presbyteros is presbyter, or one who presides, all right? So uh, it, you have a, the the... the Presbyteros in the church, the priest is another term we use. Same, it's two terms for the same position and role, coming from a, a different angles, right? So the priest is is pointing more toward the teleturgical, or the ceremonial, or the mysteriological, right? That's what it's, it's describing that aspect of the role of the priesthood, or the uh, uh, the you know we do call we do talk about the priesthood of Christ, right? We talk about he's a priest, a prophet, uh, and a um, priest, prophet, 
I just lost it. Uh, <clears throat> king. And so the three characteristics, the three uh, uh, axiomata uh, of, of, of Christ. So there's nothing wrong with that. But presbyteros uh, could and should be translated as presbyter. It's a perfectly good translation. The Levitical priesthood. No, it's not a continuation of the Levitical priesthood. No, it's a continuation of the, it's the priesthood of Christ, uh, you know, of Melchizedek. It's the, it's, it's the, uh, the Levitical was standing in the place. It was a temporary, it's been done away with. It's not, we don't have a Levitical priesthood in the Orthodox church. Uh, it's the priesthood of Christ that everyone, uh, Christ is the, is the one who gives and is given in every mystery. It's his work. We simply give our hands to him, uh, and we stand in, in the with the, the type and the place of Christ, so tipos que topos of Christ. But Christ is the one who gives, Christ is the one who blesses. Uh, we say this again and again in many prayers. Uh, he forgives, he it's all Christ, he's all in all, and so it's his priesthood. And uh, but I tell you, I've never really spent much time looking at the Levitical priesthood, so uh, I don't know much more. But that, but we, ne I've never heard in all my years anybody saying uh, anything about the continuation of the Levitical priesthood. So, thirty years, I've never heard that. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what that's my experience. Father, do you think you would be open to doing a series covering the book Entering the Orthodox Church by Metropolitan Herothios? I found this book to be immensely beneficial, but also find it's difficult to find. I uh, think you answered. Did you ask me this already? I said yes. I would like to do that, but maybe that's a different thing you asked. But I think I said yes. That that's a good idea. Um, somewhere around that I have that. Where is it? Yeah, I don't know what I do with it. But somewhere around that I have it. And I've read it, and I think it's great. I used it as catechism. So that's a good idea. We'll see. Why don't we write that down to my coworkers, John and others. Why don't we write that down as a potential future course uh, for Orthodox Ethos? Next question, do the Orthodox believe in the rapture? No, we do not. Next question. We're going to get to that eventually. I was wondering about icons. I was looking at them, and after this talk, I believe I had seen one with St. John with an open scroll. Would that be in relation to Revelation? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Is that, is, that the, is that the extent of the question? Could also be his gospel. I'm not sure what icon you're talking about. So, um, we'll get to the rapture. The guy asked somebody who asked about the rapture. I mean, don't take my my answer right now as a complete answer because I'm not going to get into it right now. But that's the short answer. There's a long answer. Uh, next question. Do, you spoke about um, working in a rural Greek village, and you also know American Orthodoxy. I know this might be a huge question, but what is the biggest difference? Well, the whole ethos and community is the biggest difference. So, you know, Greek village, I spent uh, as a priest in a small Greek village outside Thessaloniki in the mountains. I was there from 2006 to 2017. And uh, all these old Greek villages have a uh, way of life. I mean, it's unfortunately been tremendously abused, uh, not abused, uh, undermined in the twenty late 20th century, early 21st century. I mean, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of war against it with urbanization and everything else. But the Greek village has a close community. They all live around the church in the middle. They're mostly agrarian. Uh, they have a long tradition and a very tight community, and a very, uh, a very, uh, uh, their 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 ethos, their way is shared by, if not all of them, most of them. Even those who don't go to church have, have been have been uh, inculcated with the Orthodox ethos. And many times you'll find people who don't go to church and yet they think and they act socially, at least not maybe spiritually deeply, but socially they act very much in an Orthodox manner, even though they're not attending Orthodox church because it's so ingrained, it's so deep into the uh, 2,000 years, I mean, 2,000 years of orthodoxy. So you can't compare that to American orth Ameridoxy. I mean, American orthodoxy, I think I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, I was doing a 
talk back in 2013, I think it was, on St. Paisios. And I was meeting a lot of people, and I had been in Greece pretty much continually for about 13 years, just coming and going once in a while. But then I had, uh, you know, extended ex interchanges, exchange with a lot of people. And there was a lot of new converts in early 2000, 2013, whatever. There was converts coming in. I was meeting these people, and they're wonderful people. They're talking orthodoxy. But there was so – their whole way of, of interacting, it struck me as – weird and not as like a, I would call if not a secular ethos a protestant ethos a protestant way of thinking and interacting and talking uh and unfortunately you know I'm not saying that the Greeks in the village are very are all virtuous they're not they're not all wonderfully virtuous but there's certain things that just they picked up in the in their mother's milk you know you can't it's just it's different it's just like they, they there's a philotimo there Right, a love of of do, outdoing the other in generosity and hospitality, a thoughtfulness. There's just little, a lot of little things that they they do which shows respect and 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 love toward their neighbor. Um, and you and I don't think people in America are raised with that. We're raised in a very egotistical, materialistic society, uh, and it, we're not even. It's not that we're bad people. We're just not exposed to it, right? We're not exposed to these things. I mean, I said earlier that in Greece, you won't find lay people saying to the priest, God bless you, because they'll always say, you're blessing father. I mean, that's how they understand their relationship with the priest. You don't, you hear that all the time from people in America. God bless you, father. They write you. They don't say you're blessing father when they write you, or they don't ask, you know, that the traditional way of writing a priest or a bishop is at the beginning of the letter, your blessing. And at the end of the letter, I kiss your hand and ask your blessing. And that's the, you know, more traditional formal way. You don't find that in most Orthodox. And I can go on and on about a lot of different things. And it's not that, the, again, I'm not complaining. I'm just, you asked me the question, but it's not there, right? They're not being, they're not being catechized. They're not being initiated. They, they don't see examples like that around them, right? Whereas in the village, they just, they didn't even think about it. Like nobody even thinks about it. Now, I'm not saying there are people, there are people who are worldly and, and apostates. There are. Of course, <laughs> they're all over, the, and increasingly so. But generally speaking, they've inherited this this way and of thinking that they don't even think about it. Just it's just the way it is, right? How they interact with other people, the respect they have for older people. Uh, there's just a lot, and, and it's a it's a deeper communal life, right? That's the big problem in the West, and increasingly in Greece, is that they're they've left the community for an impersonal, modern industrialized city life and that is so destructive to the spiritual life right you can't live a deep spiritual life alone in isolation from your brothers and sisters you can't go deeper ultimately if you only go to church on sundays and yet that's what the majority of people do they go to church just on sunday well in the orthodox thessaloniki even which is a big city right a million and a half people the faithful, and that's not a lot of people, right? I would say it's a small percentage of the people, because unfortunately there's a lot of apostasy today, people walking away from orthodoxy all over the place in the old country. Um, but the faithful are going to church. If they're faithful, if they want to, they can. They have a church near them in the city. They're going maybe several times a week. Uh, but that's the, that's the small percentage, but that's the faithful. Whereas here, distance, the way of life, we're working... 12 hours a day, whatever it is, we don't have the blessing of a frequent uh, opportunity to go to church and, and to be and to be sanctified and to be purified by our presence in the temple of God. So anyway, I could go on and on, but that's a few things. I mean, it's a big, you opened a big, really big question. Uh, okay, or orthodoxifos. Interesting. Uh, thank you for your donation. God bless you, Father. How do we balance studying and attaining knowledge normatively while submitting to the divine revelation of God? Okay, they're two different things, right? They can coexist, but there's got to be a hierarchy. First, our relationship with God, and then everything else. Uh, should we not study certain things to attain knowledge? Of course you should. Of course you should. Uh, of course you should study things. Who's saying you shouldn't study things? Uh, now, if you go, if you were to go and look at the lives of some of the ascetics, Saint Anthony the Great, uh, you know, Saint uh, um, whatever, great ascetics, the Stylites or whatever it is, they're not doing, they're not acquiring a lot of knowledge about the world, about the created world, right? Obviously, because they're not interested. They're done. They've passed that stage, right? They want to just be with God. So, but does that mean that all of us are at that stage? Of course not. 
And what do we do in the meantime? We're, we're going to use that knowledge appropriately for our life in this world, get through it from A to Z, right? We're pilgrims here, but we got to still function in society. Of course, we're going to use all that knowledge for that purpose. But hopefully we're going to have the hierarchy right. We're not going to we're not going to have it upside down, which is where most people do, right? So their main priority is either studies or business or whatever, right? And then they say, "Oh, I'm also an Orthodox Christian. I go to church on Sundays." Well, that's secularism. That's really secularism because what is secularism? Secularism is is the idea that yeah, I'm Christian, I'm religious, uh, but it's a part of my life in this world. In other words, my life in this world is first and foremost. That's who. That's what defines me. Like, who are you? Oh, I'm a what a Kentuckian, or I'm a I'm a somebody from Macedonia, or whatever. Just to, just ask somebody. Tell me about yourself. Who are you? That's very interesting to determine. Are they a Christian or not? Like, if they start out and say, "Well, I am a businessman," or "I am a uh, educator," that's who I am. Oh, that's interesting. So your main identification is a worldly identification. It might be a very good thing. You might be doing wonderful work, but it's of this world. So this is the this is ultimately the crisis we have across the board today. We have a crisis in identity. That's what we have in ecclesiology. It's an identity crisis. Like, who are we? Are we the church? Are we part of the church? Are we in communion with other churches? Or that whole identity crisis? It ultimately, it comes out of our personal identity crisis, right? And that, that there's not a hierarchy, and we don't we haven't ordered our life properly. So that's what you're ultimately you're asking is how do I order my life? So that the function of my rational intellect, which is to get the, you know, to get the ones and twos and the ABCs and all the rest to properly order them and use them for my temporary life here. My, I'm a pilgrim, right? I got to, okay, that's, that's a given. Everybody's going to do that to that degree that we need to do that and not make that an idol, not make that the first, not make that the thing that we live for. Like what do men live for, right? There's a great short story by Tolstoy. What do men live for? Uh, it's, I highly recommend it, even though Tolstoy was an ultimate heretic. It was a great uh, uh, short story. Anyway, next question. I Hopefully that I, I answered that. How are we to understand the paranormal? Are, we, are they lost souls, strictly demons, or are they angels? We can discern demons from spirits. But are these spirits stuck on earth? Mm, I don't know what that means. We can discern demons and spirits... What are there other spirits? What are the other spirits? You're talking about like like human spirits that like no, they're not roaming around the world that you can like commune with and talk to. No, that's not true. Uh, demons and spirits are pretty much synonymous, unless you're talking about angelic spirits. Like that's basically it. And angels and demons. That's what the spiritual world is. The soul of man is not floating around the world like like a, just another spirit. That does not exist. Those They go to the place God has prepared for them until the second coming. So Hades, paradise, they're not roaming around the world. So there is no other third thing, another spirit. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. Demonic activity is pretty much the explanation for the paranormal. Right? That's, what, that's what's going on. Uh, it's, it's demonic activity and it's... There's no like the angels aren't 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 involved in that. Right? The angels have one thing, and that is to help us on the path of salvation. What's the orthodox view on penal substitutionary death of Christ? Isaiah 53 speaks of Jesus dying for our sins in our place. Yes, okay. You want me to give you a whole soteriology? I'm not prepared to do that. We'll we'll do that. We can do a whole another John and, and Timothy or whoever's listening, write it down. We'll do a, a whole podcast on it, but I don't I don't uh, do off-the-cuff uh, expositions of Orthodox soteriology. We'll put it in context. We'll put the patristic comments down. We'll answer questions in, on the basis of the patristic commentary. And we'll look at the, the claims of the various uh, Protestant soteriologies. Uh, but uh, and, and frankly, the Orthodox world has very little, has, has shown very little interest or knowledge of a lot of the various 20th century, 19th century Protestant ideas about soteriology we just don't have a lot of experience a lot of time for them because they're so usually so far away from the patristic 2000 year understanding of the saints right so but i'm happy to do that i just don't want to answer it in a way that's going to be in any way 
my response as opposed to what the holy orthodox church the holy tradition and the saints have to say so that could be a, a potential future uh podcast there's a lot going on so i don't know what i'll get to that. hopefully soon we could do a mini podcast on something what is theria another question this is mentioned a lot in the biography biography of elder joseph that has to written by elder okay so theoria is a greek term which is translated in different ways in english by different translators and it basically means vision or contemplation of the divine, a communion with the uncreated energies of God. Coming into theoria, in other words, you're, you're, you're communing face-to-face, -face, spiritually speaking, face-to-face, -face, with God, uh, which is the fruit of all of the ascetic life, essentially. So they are experiencing and communing with the divine energies, God himself, in the divine energies and um it's you know uh, paul paul going to the third heaven i mean it's theoria is is what happens when people attain great levels of illumination and and enter into the realm of of theosis uh that's the life of the great ascetics i'm a believer with what is basically an evangelical background. This is from Joshua Patrick Garrett, Super Chat. Thank you very much, Joshua. Very nice of you to give a few dollars. We appreciate it. Can you share a definitive bibliography on Orthodox theology and the first 100 years of the church? Folks, you guys, this is like a little question on the side, and you're asking me to do a whole thesis here. This is a massive. Can you share a definitive bibliography on Orthodox theology and the first 100 years of the church? Well, I tell you what, I have uh, we have a on our website, and I think it's open to the public. I don't think you have to be a member. On our website, orthodoxies.com, you can go get a reading list, a pretty extensive reading list, a bibliography of sorts. And you can there discover a lot of books that we recommend. So I would recommend that to you, Joshua. Thank you. Secondly, if you want to learn a, particularly about Orthodox ecclesiology in the first hundred years, you want to buy a book that we published. And it's one of the most important books in the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned, on ecclesiology, on the dogma of the church by St. Hilarion Trotsky, on the dogma of the church, St. Hilarion Trotsky or St. Hilarion, uh, the new martyr. And you can find it at uncommonpress.com. And he examines in 600 pages with 2,500 footnotes from the, he wrote it back in the beginning of the 20th century. He examines the Orthodox Christian, in other words, the church in the first 300 years and their response to all of the various heresies of the day. And he's going to go into all kinds of patristic responses to the heretical teachings about Christ and the church. So you're going to get a tremendous education of what the church thought in the first two to 300 years about all these issues that we're facing today. I think it's one of a really important book. I hope you can uh, benefit from it. We are pretty much the end of the road. No, we have a couple more questions over in Crowdcast, but we are getting close to the three-hour limit. So last question here, and then we'll see what we've got at Crowdcast. Father Peter, after World War III, will there be peace on earth for a few decades? Will transhumanism come next and last for decades, or will the Antichrist come sooner to introduce it? Well, I'm not a prophet, but I'll tell you what some of the prophets in our day have to say on those kind of massive things. And of course, always two things you have to remember about prophecy prophetic word in the orthodox church number one prophecies are given most of the time to be avoided in order to bring about repentance god prefers repentance as you see in the book of revelation we've been looking at it he prefers he begs he begs but he, he desires he calls for repentance so that those things that are prophesied don't come about right okay that's the first thing to remember second thing that a saint can see and prophesy something, and God cannot and may not bring it about as he saw it, depending on our repentance. So, so that's what you have to remember. And prophecies, as we've said again and again here, are understood fully and properly when they are fulfilled. When they happen, you see them and you say, this is fulfilling the prophecy of that, right? Okay, so that's really important to understand. Now, having said that, a few words of speculation, basically, and I don't think we should focus on this. It's not what we should be focusing on, but we should have it in the corner of our eye, maybe, and have it in mind, because it is from illumined men of our day. And that is that there will be, according to saints like Paisios and Elder Femme and others, there will be, very likely, if the prophecies are fulfilled, and there's no 
and it, it, unfortunately there's not repentance, there will be a World War III. Uh, Mitch Paul in the office says that we're already in it. We've already begun World War III. It just haven't gotten to the stage of full-on world uh, hot war, but it's essentially going on as we speak. And it will go hot eventually, and it will be uh, the bloodiest, most destructive conflict ever in the history of humanity. And according to what we've read here in scriptures, if this is what's prophesied in Revelation, hundreds of millions of people will be slaughtered in this war. After this, there will be an Orthodox council, which will reestablish and clarify and put the Orthodox mission on the right footing. There will be a change in power structures in the Orthodox world, and especially in Asia Minor. There will be a new mission to the world. And that nobody knows how long that'll be. No one knows how long it'll be. Some people, I mean, St. Porfirio, as I think I told you, uh, supposedly, you know, I, I was told by a very good source, said to one of his layman disciples when he said, why are we building this huge church, this massive church? I've been there. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and two months ago. And there's like 10 nuns in this massive church. It's got four, four underground chapels. I mean, it's like, what is this? And, and he said, this place is going to be filled with Orthodox Christians, people coming to be Orthodox from all over Europe. There's going to be a renewal of orthodoxy for all these Europeans who are going to be begging to return to the faith and come back to their roots in orthodoxy. So, and he said that'll happen, I think he said 100 years from now. So that, if that's true, if it's 100 years, I mean, that's very unique. Most people talk about 30. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And you can't know. All right. So that, that just forget about that. At the same time, all of the garbage that's going on today will continue. It's not going to just disappear. The the remember what it says in scripture, the holier the holy will becoming holier, and the unrighteous and sinful will become more sinful and more unrighteous. That will continue. It will be it will coexist. I asked this of Metropolitan Neal for this once. I said, how are they going to coexist? He said, well, they already do. That's the nature of things. They they're, they're going to continue to grow. So there will be a portion of humanity who will continue to become more demonic, more satanic, more delusional. And there'll be a, a portion of humanity that will embrace Christ, embrace human, uh, holiness, and, and, and embrace orthodoxy. And that actual separation of the sheep from the goats, that clarity is, is going to continue until finally you have, again, a falling away, a worldliness, and then rights given to the devil finally to bring about the, the ascent of Antichrist. All right. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Loic. For your support. I appreciate that. We don't ask for it here. I rarely talk about it, but if you want to give it, we'll take it and use it for the betterment of this work. A couple of questions over in Crowdcast, and we've only got about five minutes. We might have to answer them on Thursday. By the way, if all of you who aren't part of our Crowdcast platform, uh, are, we have Thursday night question answer sessions every Thursday. Almost every Thursday, we'll do it this Thursday. It was about two to three hours. Answer all your questions. We talk about the work of the Orthodox Ethos and Uncommon Mountain Press. We talk about issues of the day. All you got to do is go over and sign up at Patreon. One dollar. One dollar a month. So you, you, it said you can go hit the three dollar thing and then just put one dollar in if you want. If you want to put three dollars, you want to put more. It's up to you. But that's the platform we use. And there's got to be, unfortunately, some donation to get into the platform. That's just how Patreon works. They take a cut, right? So they want their cut. All right, next. Do you think we are close to having a church council to reinforce the true faith and to help us discern the massive changes? Coming? I just answered that. If you were listening, Nico, I just said after the war, there will be a church council according to the prophecies of the, of the saints. Will there be a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land this year? I'm afraid it's looking pretty Hard, but if I get some people out there, I think Paisus, if you're the Paisus I know, I'm looking forward to some help. I can't do it all. I need somebody to take it on and organize it. I'll be happy to help, but uh, I can't do it. I got way too much going on on my plate every day. So if if there are people who want to go to the Holy Land, if there's not a war going on, and there's somebody to help me organize it, then it's a possibility. But if that doesn't happen, those three things don't happen, then I don't I don't think I can do it. I've been twice to the Holy Land. I've got people there that I know. It would be a wonderful, I think I'd love to do it again. I mean, it's amazing. The Holy Land is amazing. But I don't know if we want to go in the middle of the summer. That's probably not the best idea. It's really hot. So uh, maybe early September would be a time because that's getting a little bit better in terms of, uh, um, you know, 
the weather and it, and then you have the feast of the holy cross on the 29th 27th on the old calendar that's a pretty great feast to be there father blessed is ethos another word for phronima no phronima is a mindset an outlook ethos is the way it's the it's the way people are they carry themselves their behavior their their way of life those are two different things god bless you constantina Father Peter, what, at what point do the troll, toll houses and ladder of divine ascent take place? At what, at what point? What do you mean? Uh, oh, okay. I see what you mean. So there's a whole teaching on that, and you can find it online very easily. I'm not going to attempt to lay it out, but in terms of the what the third, the ninth, and the fortieth day, look up St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, and he's got a whole article on what happens on the third, the ninth, and the fortieth day. Uh, and he'll he'll set you straight, but I'm not gonna. I don't, the time right now is not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to get into that. Okay, uh, dear Father, can you please give us the exact title or link to your interview on Counterpunch? It just I think you just put in YouTube. Father Peter here's Counterpunch. Uh, do I have it open? Let me see. Probably find it re real quick here. Let me just put it in. Hang on. Uh, Counterpunch. YouTube. Yeah, uh, no, that's not right. Uh, isn't that what it's called? Counterpunch. Um, anyway, it's not coming up for me. Uh, maybe that's it. Let's see. Is that it? No. Anyway, I don't know. You guys are gonna have to find out yourself. I on your own. I can't help you. Sorry, Alexandra. Oh, she already got the links anyway. <laughs> She's right below. All right. God bless you all. That's it. Sorry to keep you. Be good. If you want to hear some chant, I'll put some chant on at the end here. Some Orthodox chant, and then uh, we'll we'll but we'll uh, sign off here with uh, some chanting as usual of the to the Holy Cross. And then um, we'll put some chant and some images for about five minutes, and then we'll we'll be out. See you on Thursday. God bless you. Hang on one second. We'll tie it. We'll sign out. So son kiri eton la onsu kev longi son tingleronomi ansu ni. To the prayers of our Holy Father Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us.
Oh, no. 